audiobook titled Tales of the Primordial Dawn, 1 to 8, male voice by Bluefish. This work belongs to author Bluefish, source scribblehub.com. Chapter 1, A New Dawn. The world was still when I awoke. The sun was just beginning its ascent, piercing the veil of dawn with its radiant fingers. I lay there for a moment, in the comfort of my makeshift bed, drinking in the hush that comes with the promise of a new day. My mother, Aisling, was already up, her fiery red hair ignited by the first light. Maeve and Zulu were still cradled in the arms of Morpheus, their cherubic faces etched with innocent serenity. My heart swelled with a protective warmth as I glanced at them, their silent forms a reminder of the life we were building. Stepping outside, the crisp morning air pricked my skin, invigorating me. The river, our newfound lifeline, flowed with an untamed grace, its waters gleaming under the burgeoning dawn. As I knelt by its edge, the cool liquid tickled my palm, a silent greeting from our new home. I allowed the sensation to wash over me, grounding me in the reality of the present moment. The Ashaya tribe was stirring now, the air alive with quiet activity. Our tribe was small, just twenty souls seeking refuge, but the unity amongst us was our fortress. We were like scattered seeds brought together by the winds of fate, planted on this fertile river bank, our roots beginning to intertwine. Yenner, an elder, was already by the river, his weather-beaten hands guiding a spear with impressive dexterity. His figure, stooped by the weight of years, still bore a certain robustness, a testament to a life forged in the crucible of survival. As he cast his spear, his eyes gleamed with a sense of purpose, one I often found mirrored in my own gaze. Beside him, Joran, the burly blacksmith, worked with unwavering focus. The veins on his muscular arms pulsed as he crafted tools out of the river stones, the rhythmic clanging echoing across the landscape. His burly figure cast an imposing shadow, but beneath the hardened exterior, I knew him to be as gentle as the summer breeze. I approached Yenner cautiously, my bare feet sinking into the dew-kissed earth. Yenner, I greeted him, my voice cutting through the morning stillness. He turned to me, his crinkled eyes reflecting a certain depth of wisdom. Tack, my boy, he returned, a smile breaking his stern facade. A new dawn on our new home, isn't it beautiful? It is, I agreed, my gaze scanning our bustling tribe, but also daunting. Yes, he chuckled, but it's the formidable things that shape us, that give life meaning. His words echoed in my mind as I watched our tribe come alive. The fear of the unknown, the weight of survival, and the difficult task of rebuilding they were all there, simmering beneath the surface. But amidst these various trials, I saw something else a shared determination, a resilience born from loss, and an unspoken promise of a new beginning. The riverbank was more than just our new home, it was our hope, our challenge, and our canvas. As the Ashaya tribe, we were going to paint a vibrant tale of survival and progress on it. As I continued my observations, the vibrant tableau of our tribe was slowly overshadowed by the specter of memories past. Memories, as clear as the river before me, began to weave a tale of struggle and loss, a bitter reminiscence of the forces that had brought us here. The Walani clan, an imposing, relentless tide of warriors had descended upon our peaceful lands like a sudden tempest. They had surged through our fields and homes, a monstrous juggernaut of might and power that we had been powerless to halt. Their faces, twisted into expressions of savage conquest, still haunted my dreams. As I knelt by the river, I could still hear the cacophony of that fateful night, the cries of despair, the roar of flames, and the chilling battle cries of the Walani warriors. The vibrant tapestry of our lives had been ripped apart, our roots yanked from the very soil they had grown in. I recalled my mother Aisling, her emerald eyes clouded with fear, but alight with fierce determination. Maeve and Zulu, clinging to her, their innocent faces etched with confusion and terror. And I, a mere boy, could do nothing but watch as our world crumbled around us. We were the victims, powerless in the face of our invaders. I clenched my fist, the sandy granules slipping through my fingers, mirroring the helpless feeling that had gripped us. The face of the Walani chief, his ruthless gaze devoid of mercy, lingered in my mind. His voice echoed, a harsh symphony of power and dominion. We had been robbed, not only of our land but of our sense of security and belonging. Yenna's words floated back to me, it's the formidable things that shape us, that give life meaning. I pondered this, my heart a battleground of emotions. Were these struggles the crucible that would forge us into something stronger, something unbreakable? I glanced back at our tribe. Yes, we had lost our ancestral land. Yes, we had been thrust into a perilous journey. But we were not the same people who had watched our lives burn to the ground that night. As the echo of the past faded, the river seemed to whisper a gentle reassurance, 
its rhythmic flow a soothing balm to my troubled soul. My gaze traced the vast expanse of our new home, a world ripe with challenge and hope. The Walani clan had taken our past, but the future, like this fertile riverbank, was ours to shape. A slight smile tugged at the corners of my mouth. Emboldened by the steady rhythm of the river, I let its serene whispers fortify my thoughts. I stood there, barefoot on the edge of our new home, my determination springing from the deepest trenches of my soul. Our hardships were not mere scars of the past, they were stepping stones, guiding our path forward. I watched our makeshift shelters, provisional cocoons of twigs and leaves. They were but feeble comparisons to the sturdy dwellings of our past. I envisioned structures of resilience and longevity, born from the raw elements of our new home. Clay-fortified walls, resistant to the whims of the weather, accommodating to the seasons. Taking this seed of an idea, I walked over to Joran, who was consumed in his toil. The symphony of stone against stone danced in the air around us. We had crude tools, mere implements of survival. But I saw more. I saw sharper flints, efficient nets, and tools that would sculpt our survival into living. The equipment at my disposal in the future a life I once lived now gone. Yet, it could return but the first step was convincing the others that my ideas were worth the merit. Joran, I ventured my gaze on his work. What if we could improve our tools make them sharper, more efficient? I've thought I've been thinking. Joran paused, the typically focused crease on his forehead deepening. Why would you think such things? Lad he looked at me, his eyes shadowed with skepticism. These tools have served us well enough. What's brought on these thoughts? I paused unsure of what to say. These people, my people have known me since I arrived in this world. More than ten winters have passed since I could remember, but I have never voiced my ideas. It was time for a change. My thoughts then turned to food, the lifeblood of our tribe. We were mere foragers and sporadic hunters. I imagined a self-sustaining tribe, harnessing the land's abundance, crafting a symphony of nourishment and balance. Yenner, I approached the elder, each word punctuating my resolution. We could strategize our food sources, plant seeds, and regulate hunting. We could. We could thrive, not just survive. Yenner turned towards me, his face etched with lines of wisdom, his eyes questioning. Why this sudden urgency? Tack his voice echoed the hesitance I had seen in Joran. We've survived till now. What makes you think we need to change? The response wasn't the one I had hoped for. I felt a pang of disappointment, but I held my ground. We've survived, yes, I persisted, but don't we want more than just survival? Both Joran and Yenner exchanged glances, a silent conversation passing between them. This isn't a decision for us to make, Tack, Yenner said finally, his tone gentle yet firm. If you feel strongly about this, present your thoughts to the elders' council tomorrow. They'll decide what's best for the tribe. Their words, while not rejecting, were a hurdle in the path I envisioned. But hurdles were not dead ends, they were challenges, tests of conviction. I nodded, accepting their advice. I'll do that, I replied. I left them to their work and wandered the grounds observing what was happening around me. We had to do more than survive in this era. We had to progress or we'd get swept up in the annuals of time like so many others. I, Tack would do everything in my power to shape our tribe towards that future. The sun, a warm and mellow globe, was inching towards the horizon as I sought out Leora, my childhood friend. She was a forager known for her keen eye and her nimble fingers that could pluck berries from the densest thickets. As I found her, she was preparing for her evening forage, her woven basket swinging lightly from her arm. Leora, I began, treading gently on the new path my thoughts had paved. I was wondering if you come across any large fruit today, could you bring some back? Her hazel eyes, always sparkling with mischief, narrowed full of intrigue. Fruit, tack she questioned, her fingers absently twirling a stray berry. What do you need fruit for? To improve our lives a little, I confessed. She tilted her head slightly ever so confused. How are fruits going to improve our lives? I felt the corner of my mouth twitch upwards. Not the fruits, Leora. The seeds I clarified. My gaze met hers, hoping my conviction would resonate with her. If we can get the seeds, we can start our own garden. We could grow fruit ourselves. Leora's brow creased, a mirror of Joran's earlier skepticism. Garden grow fruit she echoed her voice layered with disbelief and curiosity. Tack, we're not the great mother. We can't just make food spring from the earth. But what if we can? Leora I countered, my mind whirling with the possibilities. Imagine, a patch of land near the river, the seeds buried in the earth, nurtured by the water and the sun. Over time, they'll grow into plants, producing fruit of their own. The skepticism in her eyes began to wane, replaced with a glimmer of curiosity. 
But why would the plants grow fruit for us, she questioned, her gaze turning towards the crimson and orange hues splashed across the evening sky. The plants don't grow fruit for us, Leora, I explained, my gaze following hers. They grow fruit for themselves, to protect and carry their seeds. We'd just be dot borrowing some of the fruit. And in return, we give their seeds a new place to grow. It's a cycle, a partnership. She mulled over my words, her gaze distant. I could see the wheels turning in her head, her mind wrestling with this new idea. Finally, she turned back to me, a soft smile playing on her lips. All right, tack, she conceded, her tone carrying a hint of her usual mischief. I'll bring back some fruit, but only because I'm curious to see how your partnership with the plants turns out. With that, she turned away, her form disappearing into the thickets, leaving me alone with my thoughts. The sun had now almost set, leaving a trail of ember hues behind. As Leora vanished into the evening glow, my attention was drawn to the mellifluous laughter floating from the river. My gaze found Maeve and Zulu, my cherished siblings, their mirth echoing across the tranquil water. Clad in the rustic, hand-sewn attire of our tribe, animal skins softened and molded by deft hands, they appeared like spirited young deer frolicking in the evening's embrace. Maeve, her auburn hair adorned with daisy chains, was splashing Zulu with the cool, shimmering water. Zulu, his hazel eyes alight with innocent joy, was returning her playful assault with gales of laughter, his small hands sending waves toward her. Their innocent playfulness tugged at the corners of my mouth, my heart swelling with a mix of endearment and a touch of melancholy. Pulling on my own weathered skin attire, I joined them at the river's edge. The water, cool and rejuvenating, lapped at my ankles, drawing a sigh of relief from me. As I sent a generous splash their way, their surprised shrieks filled the air, our laughter creating a symphony of familial bond. But you can't catch me, Takzula yelled, his tiny figure darting away, his footprints creating ephemeral art in the wet sand. I chased after them, the cool breeze kissing my skin, my heart pounding with joy. It was these moments, the moments of unbridled happiness, that formed the oasis in the desert of our adversities. In the midst of the game, a pang of longing cut through my heart. I wished our father could see us, his children, finding joy amid our losses. He would have been proud. The sun was now merely a soft glow on the horizon, painting the sky with hues of fading gold and emerging stars. I knew he was there, somewhere, among the stardust, watching over us. And as I chased Zulu, with Maeve's laughter echoing around us, I felt a renewed sense of purpose. It was for them, for my mother, for the Ashaya tribe, for our father's memory that I desired a better future. Their smiles, and their happiness was my strength, the guiding light on the path I was carving. As the last vestiges of the sun disappeared, and the moon ascended her night throne, I knew our journey was only just beginning. A familiar voice wove itself into the symphony of our mirth, a gentle but firm melody that effortlessly caught our attention. I turned to see our mother, Aisling, standing at the river's edge, her figure backlit by the glow of the moon. Her fiery red hair, usually cascading freely down her back, was tamed into a neat braid, signifying the weight of the day's labors. Tack, she called, her voice rich with an unspoken conversation. I responded to her call, my feet carving a path in the wet sand toward her. Behind me, the playful squabbles of my siblings subsided, an unspoken respect permeating the air. Mother, I greeted, reaching her side. She cast a loving glance over her shoulder towards Maeve and Zulu, still splashing innocently in the river. Turning to me, her emerald eyes held a mixture of determination and soft concern. Tack, she began, her voice barely above a whisper. We are a small tribe, just twenty of us. You know that, and you're growing. You're not just my son but an important member of the Ashaya. It's time that you must shoulder more responsibility. The words hung heavy in the night air, resonating with the unspoken stories of our losses. How, mother, I asked, my voice barely a whisper against the soothing lullaby of the river, my mind racing with thoughts of what she would ask of me. Aisling held my gaze, her eyes mirroring the moonlight. You must join the hunt, Tack, she said, her voice steady. It's time you stand with the adults and learn our ways. Her words rang with the gravity of the rite of passage. I glanced at the makeshift spears leaning against a nearby tree, their flint tips glinting ominously in the moonlight. Hunting was a vital skill a harsh necessity in the demanding world we lived in. But it was also a testament of courage, a bridge that connected childhood with the weighty world of adulthood. I understand, mother, I said, stealing my voice with determination. Her hand found mine, a soft squeeze conveying her faith and reassurance. When do I join them, mother, I asked, curiosity lacing my voice. 
the river's song played its soothing rhythm in the background, a comforting constant amidst our shifting realities. At daybreak, Aisling responded, her gaze affixed on the glowing orb in the night sky, as if she could perceive the break of dawn just by willing it. The hunting party, led by Odrin, the tribe's most experienced hunter, along with Bryn and Aemon, will leave as the morning star guides their way. I nodded, drinking in her words like a parched traveler at a hidden oasis. The names she mentioned were familiar, as familiar as the landscape of our village. Odrin, with his grizzled beard and hawk-like eyes, was a figure of quiet strength. Bryn and Aemon were his constant companions, seasoned hunters known for their skill and fortitude. Joining them would not only be an honor but a responsibility I was eager to undertake. All too eager to join, aren't you? Tak Aisling's voice held a lilt of amusement, her gaze softening as it met mine. I couldn't suppress the grin that danced onto my face. Yes, mother I am. It's not just about learning to hunt. It's about contributing, being a part of something larger. I want to bring food to our tribe, protect us, like father did. A silent understanding passed between us as the word father lingered in the air. A pang of longing reverberated through our shared silence, his memory still a fresh wound in our hearts. Aisling's hand found my shoulder, giving it a reassuring squeeze. Her smile was gentle, her eyes reflecting the moonlight along with an undying determination. You will, my son. I believe in you. You have your father's heart, and I know you'll do us proud. Her faith bolstered my resolve. A spark ignited within me, stoked by the prospect of fulfilling a crucial role within our tribe, of standing shoulder to shoulder with the adults. I will, mother. I will learn, I will hunt. I will do whatever it takes to help our tribe, I said, my voice steady, ringing with newfound purpose. As the whispers of the night wrapped us in its serene embrace, I stood taller, ready for the challenges that awaited me with the breaking dawn. Each beat of my heart echoed with the words, I will. For my mother, my siblings, my tribe, and myself, I would rise to the occasion. As the moon cast its luminous glow upon the world, a young hunter stood on the precipice of a new journey, ready to make his mark in the tales of the primordial dawn. Chapter 2 The Council The first tendrils of dawn stretched across the inky canvas of the sky, the world stirring to life under their warm caress. As daybreak arrived I, Tack, stood by the edge of our newly claimed riverbank. The world was a symphony of awakening. The harmonious chatter of birds greeting the day, the whispering leaves rustling under the caress of the early morning breeze, and the comforting gurgle of the river and its ceaseless journey. I held my breath, allowing the symphony to wash over me, the anticipation of the impending hunt charging the air with an electrifying hum. I let my gaze wander over my humble arsenal. In my hand I held a slender spear made from a straightened tree branch. Its tip, carved from the sharpest of flint, glimmered under the morning's first light, eager for its first expedition. Beside me, a makeshift bow and a quiver of arrows lay on the ground. The bow, crafted from the sturdy limb of a yew tree, was the product of countless hours under the watchful eye of the tribe's elder, Garan. Its taut string promised a deadly strike. The arrows, with their stone points and feathered tails, were ready to fly at my command. As I admired the weapons, a hint of trepidation intertwined with my excitement. Today, I would step out of my father's shadow and attempt to fill the void he left behind. Today, I was not just Tack, the story weaver, I was Tack, the young hunter. The sound of familiar voices drew my attention to the river's edge. There, amidst the half-light, the hunting party gathered. Odrin, his grizzled features hardened by the years, stood like a steadfast sentinel. His powerful hands cradled his hefty stone axe, its edge honed to a lethal sharpness. Beside him, Bryn and Aemon carried their spears, the tips reflecting the ethereal glow of dawn. Their eyes, alert and watchful, scanned the horizon. Morning, Tack, Odin greeted me as I approached. His voice, gravelly and deep, resonated with years of hard-earned wisdom. Morning, Odin, I responded, my voice bouncing off the silent dawn. The two other men nodded in acknowledgement, a silent acceptance of my presence in their circle. We were just discussing the strategy for today, Bryn explained, gesturing towards the dense forest that loomed beyond the river. And making our offerings to the spirits of the forest, Aemon chimed in, his eyes reflecting the glow of a nearby fire, around which lay a small collection of offerings, berries, seeds, and a small figurine carved from bone. I nodded, understanding the rituals and the respect we accorded to the life we sought. The elders often said, we are part of the land, and the land is a part of us. Respect it, for it gives us life. And so, we always began our hunts with an offering, an appeal for safe passage, and a promise of gratitude. So, ready for your first hunt, young one Odrin's question jolted me from my reverie, 
his eyes appraising me with a hint of unspoken challenge. I am, I responded, standing tall under his scrutiny. I'm ready to learn, to hunt, to contribute. A brief silence fell upon us, the river whispering its ancient lullaby as the world held its breath. Then, Odrin nodded, a small grin playing on his lips. Good, that's what we need. Let's begin then. As the world awakened around us, we, the hunters of the Ashai tribe, stood under the canvas of the breaking dawn, ready to embrace the dance of survival. Together we vanished into the forest searching for our prey, the creature that would give its life so that we all can continue on for the next couple of days. The world blurred around us as we ventured deeper into the heart of the wilderness. Our steps were silent, measured, and harmonious, a dance with nature as we delved into the age-old game of predator and prey. The forest, alive with the melodies of hidden creatures, enveloped us in its enigmatic charm. As we crept further, the call of a distant bird stopped us in our tracks. Eamon lifted his hand, the signal to freeze clear as day. We held our breaths, our ears straining to decode the secrets whispered by the forest. Moments later, the undergrowth ahead rustled, subtly altering the rhythm of the wilderness. There, Odrin breathed, his finger pointing towards a cluster of ferns. From behind their feathery veil, a pair of obsidian eyes glittered, staring back at us. Our collective gaze followed Odrin's finger to the creature that owned those eyes, a magnificent boar. The boar, a paragon of wilderness, stood with an air of serene majesty. Its coarse fur, a mottled canvas of earthy hues, mirrored the raw, untamed beauty of the forest. The boar's hefty form was complemented by a pair of formidable tusks, curving in a crescent, a testament to its untamed power. Behind the boar, in the dappled shadow of the ancient trees, a herd grazed peacefully. Their calmness, juxtaposed against the electric tension hanging over our hunting party, painted a surreal tableau of life in the primordial dawn. I felt my heart pound against my ribs, the thrill of the chase spreading through my veins like wildfire. I tightened my grip on my spear, the weapon seeming to thrum with the rhythm of my pulse. Odrin's low, gravelly voice pulled me out of my thoughts. Tack, he began, his tone deliberate, today is your initiation. The boar is a formidable animal, but it's an honor to face it, to learn from it. He paused, his gaze scanning the faces of our hunting party. A shared unspoken agreement passed through the group, there nods a solemn approval of Odrin's words. He continued, you have shown courage and eagerness. Today, we ask that you bring those qualities to this trial. Face the boar, Tack. Be our hunter. The gravity of Odrin's words sunk into me, their echoes reverberating through the depths of my being. I glanced at each hunter, Odrin, Bryn, Aemon, all their gazes bore into me, reflecting a blend of expectation, trust, and unspoken encouragement. I will, I said, my voice clear, carrying the weight of the honor bestowed upon me. I lifted my spear, its flint tip glittering ominously under the dappled forest light, the silent promise of the hunt echoing in the stillness of the wilderness. As we readied ourselves, the forest held its breath, time seemingly suspending itself. The morning sun, having conquered the night, now illuminated the clearing with a soft, golden glow. The stage was set, and I, Tack of the Ashaya tribe, was ready to dance with the rhythm of the wild. As I moved with measured grace, my heart pounded in my ears like a primal drum, a rhythm as old as the dawn of mankind. The spear in my hand was an extension of my will, a silent promise of the dance about to unfold. The boar seemed to sense the charge in the air. It stood still, an imposing statue of raw, untamed power in the emerald theater of the forest. I closed the distance, my every sense honed onto my quarry. Just as I was within striking range, I lunged, the spear slicing through the air with a whistling urgency. But in a fraction of a second, the boar swerved, its instincts quicker than my novice hands. My spear met nothing but air and a spray of fallen leaves. The boar's grunt of alarm echoed through the clearing, shattering the cathedral-like silence. Like a ripple effect, the herd's tranquility was shattered, their peaceful grazing morphing into a symphony of panic. With the agility and grace that belied their hefty frames, they disappeared into the protective cloak of the forest, vanishing as if by some ancient, primal magic. A bitter taste of failure lingered on my tongue, disappointment gnawing at the edges of my newfound hunter's pride. But before the cloud of regret could fully descend upon me, the sharp twang of a bowstring sang through the air. Amen, with the ease and precision of years of experience, had let loose an arrow. It flew with lethal accuracy, finding its mark in a lagging member of the herd. As the dust of our encounter settled, the once peaceful clearing bore the marks of our presence. The thrill of the hunt had given way to the sobering lesson of experience. Odrin moved towards me, his eyes softer than I expected, understanding gleaming in their depths. 
Remember this moment. Tack, he began, his voice the comforting rumble of distant thunder, and the dance of the hunt. There are no failures, only lessons. Today, you've learned the most important one of all. You are a part of this rhythm. Follow the flow and don't go against it. Your spear did not find its mark today, but your spirit did. In facing the boar you've honored us. His words, spoken with the wisdom that comes with age and experience, were a balm to my chafed ego. They soothed the sting of failure, replacing it with the quiet flame of resolve. I nodded, accepting his words and the profound lesson they carried. Our day broke on the dance of the hunt, a testament to our determination and the promise of survival. Though my initiation didn't go as I had envisioned, the dawn brought with it the echo of lessons learned and a reaffirmation of my place in the Ashaya tribe. The sun, rising higher in the sky, painted the clearing in hues of victory and wisdom. Daybreak had arrived, bringing with it the promise of many hunts and many lessons yet to come. Under the gentle morning light, our party trudged back towards our tribe's camp, the echoes of the hunt still resonating in our hearts. The boar Amon had felled was carried between us, the creature too large for one near person to carry alone. As we crossed the threshold of our village, a tangle of shapes and sounds met our senses. Children's laughter rang in our ears, a melody of innocence and joy. Fires crackled, their smoke curling up into the clear azure sky, as women busied themselves with their morning chores. And there, amidst it all, was Leora. Her fiery hair glinted in the sun, her slender frame swaying gently as she moved towards us, a radiant beacon guiding us home. In her hand was a perfectly round, deeply hued red fruit. My heart fluttered as I recognized it, a shard of my previous life surfacing in the mundane reality of our Neolithic existence. I approached her, my heart pounding in a rhythm of anticipation. Leora's emerald eyes sparkled with mirth as she met my gaze. Found this on my gathering, she chirped, the unassuming fruit cradled in her palms. Thought it was just another berry. It's big and hefty though, could make for a hearty meal. I took the fruit from her, my fingers grazing hers. It was a tomato, a fruit that held the promise of a bountiful future. Leora, you have no idea what you've found, I said, my voice hushed in reverence. Her eyebrows knitted together in confusion. It's just a fruit, Tack. It's not just any fruit, Leora, I tried to explain, a wide grin spreading across my face. It's the key to a future where we don't have to hunt every day, where we can grow our food right here in our village. It's a tomato. A tomato, she echoed, the foreign word fumbling on her tongue. Sounds fancy. And you're saying we can grow these? Yes, I confirmed, giving her a tight hug, relief, and joy bubbling within me. This is exactly what I needed. You've done us a great favor, Leora. She returned my embrace, her confusion melting into a hesitant smile. Well, I'll be sure to keep an eye out for more of these. Tomatio S. then. Our tribe, our home, was taking its first steps towards a brighter future. A future where we could survive and thrive. The sun was still rising, its rays bathing our village in hues of hope and promise painting a new dawn for the Ashaya tribe. And in that moment, standing with Leora, the tomato in my hand felt like a symbol of change. There was so much this one fruit could change, and I was ready to show that to the elders. Take a bite, I encouraged Leora, presenting her with the tomato once again. She hesitated, her eyes darting between the unfamiliar fruit and my earnest expression. Is it safe, she asked, uncertainty seeping into her voice. It was a valid question. Many fruits we found in the wild had adverse effects, a risk we took each time we discovered something new. I chuckled at her concern, my heart fluttering at her innocent curiosity. Yes, Leora, it's safe. Our ancestors grew these. They're delicious. You'll see. She cast me a dubious glance before gingerly bringing the tomato to her lips, taking a small, tentative bite. The juices dribbled down her chin as her eyes widened in surprise, the burst of tangy sweetness taking her aback. This. This is good, she exclaimed, another bite immediately following the first. She chewed thoughtfully, her gaze distant as if trying to place the flavors and textures dancing on her tongue. Gleefully, I watched as she relished the tomato, a feeling of satisfaction washing over me. When she'd had her fill, I gently took the partially eaten fruit from her, turning it over to reveal the cluster of seeds nestled within. You see these I pointed at the seeds, their minute form and yellowish hue contrasting with the bright red of the tomato's flesh. These are seeds. There. They're like the beginnings of a new life. Seeds she echoed, curiosity etching her features. How do they? Grow I finished for her, a grin playing on my lips. Yes. We plant them, take care of them, and over time, they grow into new tomato plants. That's how we can cultivate our own food, grow our own crops. 
Her eyes widened, a flicker of understanding dancing within their emerald depths. So, we just plant these little things and get more of. These she gestured to the remainder of the tomato in my hand. Exactly I confirmed, my heart swelling at her quick comprehension. We need to nurture them, of course. They'll need water, sunlight, and care. But if we do it right, we can have our own field of tomatoes, enough to feed us and more. A silence stretched between us, the gravity of the moment sinking in. The simplicity of it, the potential that these tiny seeds held, was overwhelming. Yet, it was a tangible, reachable future within our grasp. The prospect of a sustainable life was no longer a distant dream. It was right there, nestled in the heart of a tomato, held within the promise of a handful of seeds. Leora glanced at the remaining half of the tomato, her fingers lightly brushing over the seeds within. So, she began, her voice almost a whisper, if these seeds can grow more tomatoes, does that mean we can grow other things too? Her question made me proud. She was smart and eager for an answer. Yes, Leora, I answered, excitement warming my voice. We can grow all sorts of food. Anything that has a seed can give birth to a new plant. Be it berries, fruit from trees, vegetables, sometimes even golden stalks that grow by water. All it takes is a seed, sunlight, water, and time. Her face seemed to light up at the prospect, her eyes twinkling with wonder and hope. So, we won't have to go hunting or gathering so much, she asked, her voice filled with awe and disbelief. We could have our own food, right here at home. Exactly, I replied, my heart thudding in my chest at her enthusiasm. We would still hunt, of course, but this, this could provide a steady source of food. We wouldn't be so dependent on what we find in the forest. And more importantly, it's a way to ensure our survival if hunting proves unsuccessful, or if resources in the forest deplete. The words hung in the air between us, heavy with significance. The endless cycle of search and struggle for food could change, could ease. The thought was almost too overwhelming to process. You. You should tell this to the elders. Liara finally managed, her voice choked with emotion. This. This could change everything. I nodded, my gaze meeting hers. I plan to, Leora. I plan to tell them at the council meeting today. There was an urgency now, a compelling force driving me towards this new path. It was the glimmer of hope that we had all been seeking amidst the desperation and loss. With these seeds, with this knowledge, I had a chance to lead my tribe towards a future where food wasn't a scarcity but a certainty. The significance of the moment wasn't lost on me. As the sun rose higher, bathing the land in its warm, golden light, the promise of a new dawn for the Ashaya tribe was etched in those tiny seeds. And as Leora and I stood there, by the river, sharing this groundbreaking realization, I knew that our journey had just begun. Today, at the council meeting, the seeds of change would be sown. The setting sun painted the sky with hues of orange and pink, signaling the end of the day and the beginning of the council meeting. This was where the elders of the Ashaya tribe would meet to discuss matters of significance and take important decisions. As my mother led me towards the circle of elders, I could feel the curious gazes of my tribe's folk boring into me. I was a newcomer here, an unusual sight in this gathering dominated by the experienced and the wise. Why is Takir one of the elders, a stern woman named Rasha, asked, her brows furrowed. Her voice, though not unkind, carried an air of authority that made me swallow nervously. He has discovered something, something that he believes can benefit our tribe, my mother explained her hand on my shoulder reassuring me. I noticed the expressions of the elders changing, some were filled with curiosity while others carried a hint of skepticism. Why should we let a child speak at the council meeting isn't this a place for elders question Mako, a grizzled veteran of many battles and hunts. Before my mother could retort, a deep, calm voice echoed through the gathering. It was our tribe's leader, Elder Akira. His eyes, gray with age, were full of wisdom and understanding. Let him speak, Mako, he said, his gaze on me now. We are all here for the betterment of our tribe, aren't we? And if a child can contribute to that, why shouldn't we listen? Silence fell on the council as they awaited my words. My heart thudded in my chest, but Elder Akira's words filled me with courage. The council members sat in a semicircle, their faces a composite of curiosity and skepticism, illuminated by the flickering firelight. Their eyes bore into me, and for a moment, I faltered under their collective gaze. Mako, the most formidable of the hunters, was the first to break the silence, his gruff voice echoing in the hushed surroundings, speak up, boy. What is this discovery you speak of? With a deep breath to steal my resolve, I stepped forward, the half-eaten tomato and seeds held out in my open palms. What I hold in my hands might be the key to our survival, I began, my voice steady. 
elders, warriors, friends, I paused, looking at each one in the eye before continuing, these tiny specks here, I pointed at the seeds, are not just any remains we can discard, they are the fruit of life itself, given the right conditions they can give birth to new plants and fruits, my declaration hung in the air, punctuated by the occasional crackle of burning wood, Mako sneered, his voice laced with doubt, this sounds like a child's dream, tack, no Mako, it is not a dream, I retorted, meeting his gaze squarely. The council members sat in silence, digesting my words, each lost in their thoughts. The fire crackled in the silence, throwing sparks into the twilight. Finally, Rasha broke the silence, her voice pushing me down with its authoritative tone. Is this another one of your tales we cannot grow food? Only the mother can. A murmur of agreement rippled through the council. I felt my heart sink, but I didn't let it show on my face. I needed to convince them. I knew our survival could depend on this. Have you seen this yourself? Tackett was Elder Akra who spoke, his tone curious, his gaze intent. Yes, Elder, I responded. Holding the seeds in my palm, I held them up for the council to see. These seeds can give us more of these fruits, if we allow them to. We just need to try, and with a little time we shall have a field of these. Imagine, no more foraging over large distances hoping, praying to find something. Instead, just a short walk over to the field where we plant these seeds, and grab one of the many fruits or vegetables. A hum of intrigue spread through the council. Mako, however, seemed unimpressed. And who will guard these? Seeds while they grow. Tack we can't afford to spare warriors from hunting to watch over fields. I hadn't expected this challenge. But as I thought about it, I realized he was right. However, I wasn't about to back down. Not warriors, Mako, I replied, meeting his gaze steadily. This wouldn't be a task for the strong and the swift. This would be for everyone. Women, elders, children. Each of us could contribute. Each of us could ensure our tribe's survival. You speak boldly, young one, Mako grunted, crossing his arms. Yet there was a spark of interest in his eyes that hadn't been there before. Elder Akra leaned back, his eyes thoughtful. It is an intriguing idea, Tack. If this seed growing could indeed help us survive and thrive, it is worth considering. But it's a risk, another elder, Jara, voiced her concern. We know hunting. This is new. All progress comes with risk, Jara, said Elder Akira, his gaze now turned towards the night sky, where the first stars had begun to twinkle. We will take this under consideration, Tack. For now, you have given us much to think about. The council meeting ended with the usual rituals. But as I walked away with my mother, the air felt different. It was as if a seed had indeed been planted, not just in the earth but in the minds of the Ashaya tribe. As I drifted to sleep later that night, my dreams were filled not with the thrill of the hunt, but with the sight of verdant fields under a clear blue sky, our tribe thriving and smiling. For the first time in a long while, I allowed myself to hope. Chapter 3 For Our Future Daylight seeped gently through the leafy canopy, dappling the forest floor with an inviting warmth. The first chirps of the day echoed, a melodious symphony that aroused the sleeping woods. I walked alongside Leora, our hands gloved by the rough texture of animal skins, as we ventured deeper into the forest. With each step, I paused to mark our path, leaving deliberate signs on the smooth bark of the trees, ensuring we could find our way back. My fingers brushed the rough bark, my eyes flicking upward to watch the changing hues of the canopy above. Leaves, once a vibrant canvas of green, were gradually transforming, surrendering their colors to the spectrum of reds, yellows, and oranges. The air carries a different tune, doesn't it I observed, inhaling the crisp coolness that began to weave its way through the forest. The leaves are shedding their green cloaks. The wind's whisper grows colder each day. It's a sign, a cycle of life and death, then life again. Leora, her basket brimming with assorted berries, nodded, her eyes gleaming with intrigue. It's almost as if the forest is preparing for a long sleep, she said, a note of curiosity tinging her voice. Even the growth of the tomatoes we planted seems to slow down. Though, their fruits have already swayed the minds of the elders. I smiled, gently picking up a fallen leaf from the forest floor. Its veins, a network of life now fading, mirrored the complexity of the path we tread on. This is just the beginning, Leora, I said, my voice steady with conviction. There's still a lot we can learn and adapt to. For instance, we need to find something that can endure the times when the earth turns white and cold. Leora's brows furrowed, her eyes wide with wonder. White and cold, she echoed her voice barely above a whisper. Is this the snow you spoke of, Tack? I cast a glance at Leora, my gaze soft yet contemplative. 
Yes, I nodded, my eyes fixed on the leaf in my hand. Snow. It's what happens when the temperature drops too low. The rain that falls doesn't stay as water. It becomes something dot different. Different how Leora asked, her eyes following the path of a bird as it darted through the canopy. Well, I began, running my thumb over the rough texture of the leaf. Imagine if the raindrops were tiny, delicate crystals. They pile up, covering the ground like a soft, white blanket. It's beautiful, but also deadly. Deadly we've survived that before. It doesn't seem deadly. Leora echoed, her voice barely a whisper. Her eyes, wide with surprise, were fixed on me. But it is, I said. When the snow falls, everything becomes colder. If we aren't prepared, it can lead to death. Remember last time we lost many of our people during the time the snow was covered white. Underneath the kaleidoscope of hues above us, Leora and I continued our expedition through the morning-lit forest. The silence between us was a comforting companion, broken only by the sporadic calls of unseen avians and the gentle whispers of the cool breeze. Yet, as we navigated through the verdant labyrinth, a pressing thought weighed heavily on my mind, a concern that soon found its way into our conversation. As the season changes, so do the creatures of this forest, I voiced, my words carrying a tinge of solemnity. The animals we hunt. They are elusive, becoming scarce where they once roamed in abundance. We now must journey farther than usual, spend more days in pursuit of a prize that was once at our doorstep. Leora, attentively listening, nodded, her eyes reflecting a hint of worry. The plush berries in her basket seemed less vibrant, their sweetness slightly overshadowed by the concern brought by my words. I know, she confessed, her tone filled with empathy. The elders have noticed too. They believe that the time may be coming for us to move, to follow the rhythm of the forest, just as our prey does. I paused, my gaze drifting to the shifting hues of the surrounding foliage. The concept of moving felt like the winds of a brewing storm, unsettling yet inevitable. I drew in a deep breath, feeling the coolness of the air against my skin, and the weight of the decision that loomed over us. But our tribe just started laying down roots here. Leora, I expressed, my voice tinged with a mix of reluctance and uncertainty. Our food crops are growing, the shelters are coming up. This place. It has become more than a mere stop for us. There is much we can do here with the river flowing towards our back. Leora gave me a reassuring look, her eyes conveying understanding. Her hand found mine, a comforting gesture that anchored me in the present moment. I know, Tack, she responded, her voice steady. But perhaps we can find a way to coexist. Maybe we can carry our seeds with us, plant them wherever we go, turn every place we stop into a home. I looked at Leora, her unwavering resolve shining through. But there must be a way we can stay here, I argued, my words carrying a slight edge. The soil here is fertile, the river flows year-round, and the land teems with plants and animals. This place. It's special, Leora. I know, Tack. I love it here too, she confessed, her voice barely above a whisper. I love the sight of the river every morning its gentle whisper, the way it sparkles under the sun, the forest, the scents, the sounds, everything. She paused for a moment, her eyes reflecting the love she held for our surroundings. I pray to our ancestors that there is a way we can remain here, she said, her voice filled with hope. But we must also prepare for the worst. We have to ensure the survival of our tribe, even if it means we must move. The conversation ebbed into silence, the weight of our words hanging heavily in the air. The future was uncertain but it was a reality we had to face. With a silent nod, I squeezed Leora's hand in acknowledgement, appreciating her wisdom and foresight. I will do everything in my power to ensure we can stay here, Leora, I vowed, determination hardening my voice. I'll look for solutions, make adaptations. There must be a way. Leora smiled, a sincere, heartwarming smile that brought a sense of calm amidst the sea of uncertainty. I know you will, Tack. My eyes fell upon an anomaly sprouting from the earth. It was a thin, green stalk, its leaves like a fan of emerald feathers, leading down to a round, red tip peeking out of the soil. Curiosity peaked. Leora gently grasped the stalk and pulled, unearthing a bulbous, crimson vegetable. Its smooth, earthy surface was still adorned with specks of soil, a testament to its humble origin. Tack, look at this, she exclaimed, her voice brimming with excitement, holding up the peculiar vegetable for me to see. It gleamed in the morning sunlight. What is this? Surprised, I took the vegetable from her and brushed off the remaining soil, recognizing its unique form. Memories flooded my mind, echoes of ancestral wisdom passed down through generations. This. This is a radish, Leora, I revealed, my voice filled with awe. Her eyebrows arched, 
curiosity dancing in her eyes. A radish she echoed, her tone tinged with skepticism. And just how do you know that, Tack? A wry smile tugged at my lips as I placed the radish back into her hands. It's knowledge handed down to us, a connection to our past. Our ancestors were aware of such plants, of the hidden treasures nestled in the soil beneath our feet. I explained, my voice carrying a sense of reverence. But can we eat it? Leora questioned, her gaze fixed on the red bulb, her skepticism lingering. Chuckling softly, I found comfort in her skepticism, knowing that the surprises of nature often seemed unbelievable. We clean it, cut it, and eat it, I reassured her. It can be enjoyed as it is or cooked with water over a fire with meat, offering different flavors depending on how it is prepared. Cooked with water over a fire with meat, Leora echoed, her brows knitting together in bewilderment. But how can water cook meat? Tack water puts out fire. I laughed softly, feeling a strange sense of gratification at her curiosity. Not directly, Leora, I clarified, picking up a smooth stone from the forest floor. Imagine if we had a stone bowl or pot, something that can withstand the fire's heat. We could put water and meat into it, and place it over the fire. The heat of the fire warms the water, which then cooks the meat. Leora looked at me, her eyes widening in wonder. A stone bowl or pot? She repeated, her voice trailing off. That would certainly change the way we prepare our meals. But wouldn't making such a thing be difficult? Yes, it would, I admitted, running a hand through my hair. But I believe we can do it. We have already made so much progress, and with the help of Joran and Yenner, we can create these tools. Her skepticism seemed to dissolve as she considered the possibility. Her eyes shone with a new excitement, her mind obviously spinning with the potential applications of such a tool. That. That sounds amazing, Tack, she admitted. Imagine the food we could prepare, the flavors we could discover. I can't wait to taste meat cooked in water. Her enthusiasm was infectious, her spirit unbreakable. My heart swelled with pride for my sister, her unwavering trust in our capabilities. Our tribe had come so far, and with each new discovery, we took a step closer to a future of prosperity and progress. It will take time, Liara, I cautioned, my tone serious. But I promise you, one day, we will cook our meat in water. We will taste the flavors of our labor and progress, and it will be worth every effort. The morning had been fruitful, with Leora's basket overflowing with the forest's bounty. Still, my curiosity lingered, an unrelenting force guiding my gaze across the landscape. And then, on the horizon, I spotted it, a cluster of tall, swaying stalks adorned with gold and silk tassels. It was a plant I had only seen in my dreams, visions passed down from the ancients. There, I whispered, my voice barely audible pointing toward the mesmerizing sight. That's... It's corn, I declared, my excitement seeping into my words. Leora squinted in the direction of my outstretched finger. Her curiosity peaked. Corn, she echoed, her tone filled with intrigue. Let's go take a closer look. With eager steps, we ventured deeper into the unknown, drawn by the allure of this newfound discovery. Our eyes widened in wonder as we approached the robust ears of corn, their husks sheltering the promise of golden kernels within. Leora, her heart racing with anticipation, reached out to touch one of the ears, but then hesitation washed over her. She turned to face me, her gaze filled with uncertainty. Tack, she began, her voice trembling with apprehension. Is this safe, she asked, her voice barely a whisper against the quiet rustle of the swaying corn stalks. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. It's beautiful, but... Are you sure we can eat this? I couldn't help but chuckle, touched by her cautious optimism. Yes, Leora, it is safe and we can certainly eat this, I reassured her, offering her an encouraging nod. We'll need to cook it first, but yes, we can eat it. This, I said, sweeping a hand over the cornfield, is a gift from our ancestors, a promise of a bountiful harvest. A small smile tugged at the corners of her mouth as she contemplated my words, her eyes gleaming with a newfound resolve. Tack, she finally murmured, her voice carrying a hint of admiration. You have the luck of our ancestors. You keep finding things that are entirely new to me yet so familiar to you. I guess the ancestors just can't help but spoil their favorite child, I quipped, my eyes twinkling with mirth. At that, Leora erupted into a fit of laughter, her joyous sound echoing through the quiet stillness of the cornfield. The sight of her laughter warmed my heart, her infectious spirit spreading a wave of ease throughout my being. We have a lot to look forward to, Leora, I said, my voice filled with optimism. Our ancestors have left us a rich legacy, and it's up to us to unravel it learn from it, and continue to build upon it. As we returned to the tribe, 
The familiar sounds and scents of our bustling community enveloped me like a warm embrace. The aroma of cooking food mingled with the hum of conversations, creating a sight of bustling activity. Leora veered off to share the fruits of her harvest with the others, and I found myself drawn to the outskirts of our settlement, where Odrin, the seasoned hunter, was engrossed in his task of cleaning his tools. Odrin, I called out, my voice riding the gentle current of the nearby river. He looked up, a weathered smile playing across his face, evidence of a life lived in harmony with the wilderness. Tack, he responded, nodding in recognition. What brings you here, lad? I wanted to discuss something with you. I began, my eyes shining with the question that had simmered in my mind throughout our journey. The animals, their migration patterns. They've been changing, haven't they? Odrin paused his work, studying me with a focused gaze. His eyes narrowed slightly, acknowledging the truth in my words. I, he admitted, his voice carrying the weight of experience. They've been moving farther away, making the hunt more challenging. And more dangerous, I added, my voice tinged with concern. He nodded in agreement. Indeed, lad. It puts our hunters at greater risk. So I've been thinking, I continued, my voice steady, brimming with a burgeoning idea. What if we could capture the animals instead of chasing them build enclosures to contain them? Enclosure Odrin was confused by my word choice. I nodded to show him that is what I meant to say. Like our homes, but one for animals instead. Odrin raised an eyebrow, contemplating the notion I presented. It's no small task, Tack, he cautioned. Catching an animal is one thing, but keeping it confined is another. They'll bolt at the first opportunity. But imagine if they had nowhere to run, I countered, my determination shining through. If we could construct sturdy enclosures, large enough to hold them, we could secure a consistent food source. We could focus more on our crops, and reduce the risks our hunters face. Odrin pondered my words, his gaze drifting toward the lush foliage beyond our settlement. It's a bold thought, he acknowledged, a glimmer of hope emerging in his eyes. Sounds interesting, but difficult to manage. I nodded, absorbing his assessment, the wheels in my mind turning. I understand the challenges, Odrin. But if we can keep even a few animals close by, it would be a step toward securing our future. I believe it's worth exploring. He regarded me not just as a young man with ideas, but as a potential leader, poised to shape our tribe's destiny. A sigh escaped him, followed by a nod of agreement. Perhaps you're onto something, lad, he conceded a glimmer of optimism lighting up his weathered face. I'll bring this proposal to the elders. Gratitude surged within me, knowing that our conversation had planted a seed of change, a seed that could transform our way of life. As the day wore on, I found myself drawn to the construction site where the men of the tribe were working on building new dwellings. The structures taking shape before my eyes were humble, pieced together with branches, leaves, and mud. While functional, they fell short of the homes I had known in my previous life. They lacked durability, leaked during rainfall, and provided little insulation from the cold nights that were sure to come. Standing there, watching the framework of the dwellings take form, I couldn't help but envision a better future for our tribe. I longed for the comfort and stability of brick and mortar, of heated floors and well-insulated roofs. But those luxuries were beyond our reach in this Neolithic age. It was clear that we needed to work with the resources available to us and find innovative solutions within our current constraints. I knelt down and picked up a handful of the mud mixture, feeling its malleability as it oozed through my fingers. It was plentiful and sturdy when dried. Could we transform this simple mud into bricks? Could we layer these bricks to create more resilient and insulated homes? These thoughts swirled in my mind as I surveyed our settlement. Yes, our homes served their purpose, but I believed we could do better. We didn't have to settle for mediocrity. We could strive for improvement, even within the limitations of our time. I wanted the tribe to see that there were possibilities beyond what they considered acceptable, that we could elevate our standard of living. However, I knew that gaining their trust and acceptance would not be easy. They were set in their ways, cautious about embracing change. They viewed me as the young outsider with unconventional ideas. To make a difference, I needed to prove myself and earn their respect. I gazed towards the snow-capped mountains in the distance, a reminder of the approaching winter and the challenges it would bring. Determination welled up within me and I silently made a pledge. By the time the first snowflakes fell, I would show the tribe what I was capable of. As I walked towards the heart of our settlement, I carried with me the hope that one day, we would have homes that provided warmth and comfort. Change was on the horizon, and I was determined to be the catalyst that ignited it. My ruminations were interrupted by the sound of soft footsteps. I turned around to see my mother, 
her face weathered with time yet still reflecting an ethereal beauty, her eyes holding the wisdom of years. Her garb of woven reeds and animal skins rustled quietly in the cool breeze. Lost in your thoughts again, Tak she asked, a knowing smile playing on her lips. I looked at my mother, my eyes reflecting the thoughts whirling in my mind. I'm just thinking about our future, mother, I confessed. I motioned towards our fragile homes, the bare-bones structures standing stark against the twilight. About how we could live, not just survive. She followed my gaze, her eyes lingering on the structures for a moment. Then, she looked back at me, her expression thoughtful. You always did have a mind for more, she murmured, her gaze soft with affection. It's a trait your father had, the ability to see beyond what was in dream of what could be. A pang of longing cut through me at the mention of my father. I missed the man's wisdom, his guidance. I missed the way he would sit me down, explaining the ways of our people and the world around us. But mother, I began, uncertainty clouding my features, do you think the tribe will listen will they see the sense in changing the way we've always done things? My mother chuckled, her laughter light, like the rustling of leaves against the wind. My son, change is a difficult path to tread, but it is the ones who dare to walk it who become leaders. If you speak with conviction, with passion, they will listen. A sense of purpose flared within me at her words. I knew I had a long journey ahead, filled with the trials of convincing my tribe, of winning their trust, but her words fueled my determination. Leadership. I murmured, the word feeling heavy on my tongue. You think I could be a leader, mother? My mother looked at me, her eyes reflecting the fading sunlight. Yes, Tack, she said with a certainty that left no room for doubt. I do. I see the spark in you, the same spark your father carried. Your love for our people, your vision for our future, your courage to challenge the norm. They are the marks of a great leader. I was silent, my mother's words ringing in my ears. A leader. Could I be what my mother saw in me? Could I lead my tribe towards a future I saw so clearly in my mind? With a resolute nod, I turned back towards the river, my heart buoyed by my mother's faith in me. I will try, mother, I said, my voice brimming with resolve. For the tribe, for father, and for our future. Chapter 4 The Story Weaver Night blankets our tribe's dwelling engulfing it in an abyssal darkness only broken by the flickering flames. We huddle together, drawn close by the comforting warmth of the fire, our faces bathed in its radiant glow. The crackling embers create fleeting shadows that dance upon our tawny skin. This is our time of unity, a cherished moment beneath the starry night sky. Seated on a log, my figure is outlined against the fiery backdrop, my gaze shifting toward the enshrouded forest. Deep in thought, my brow furrows with worry. The clear night sky reflects my concerns, as stars twinkle down upon me, their distant light appearing pale and cold, a reminder of the impending winter. Winter, I ponder, that biting cold, the silent, invisible foe that steals warmth from our bodies and claims lives without warning. I remember the last winter, when snow draped our village like a shroud, bringing a frosty death in its wake. Our tribe, already fragile from constant struggle and scarce resources, was reduced to a mere thirty souls. Each loss felt like a fresh wound, a scar etched upon our collective heart. My heart aches at the memory. Each member of our tribe is invaluable, every life a thread weaving the fabric of our community together. And each winter, that fabric teeters on the edge of unraveling, threatened by the chilling winds that whistle through the gaps left by those no longer with us. Suddenly, a soft voice interrupts my somber musings. It's my younger sister, her eyes brimming with innocence, tugging at my animal skin cloak. Her curly hair gleams in the firelight, her cheeks radiating warmth. Tack, she begins, her voice carrying through the stillness of the night. Will you tell us a story? A story? Her request pulls me from my contemplation. I look at my sister, her expectant eyes shining with anticipation. Other young faces turn towards me, captivated by the moment. My heart swells with affection at the sight. Stories, I realize, are more than mere entertainment. They are vessels of wisdom, carriers of morals. Echoes of our ancestors passed down through generations. They offer hope and courage, promising a future where we not only survive but thrive. A smile graces my lips, the corners lifting gently. Of course, I agree, my voice a soothing balm against the cold night. I cast one last glance at the stars, their twinkling presence now less foreboding. The task ahead is daunting, the journey ahead difficult. But as I begin to weave a tale for my eager audience, I realize that stories, like seeds, have the power to ignite change. A hush descends upon the group as I begin my story, my voice flowing like a gentle tide into the silence. The flame at the center of our gathering flickers and dances, casting an otherworldly glow on the faces turned towards me. 
The night hums with anticipation as our tribe's narrative tradition is revived once again. Once, long ago, I start, my eyes sparkling in the firelight, there existed a magnificent lion, the ruler of the jungle. His roar could shake the earth, and his power was unmatched. Gasps of awe escaped the younger children, their eyes widening at the vivid image painted by my words. Even the adults are captivated, leaning in, their attention fully absorbed by my storytelling. Every so often, I catch a nod of approval from Elder Akira, seated across the fire, his stern countenance softened by the flickering flames. But I continue, a mischievous glimmer entering my gaze, despite all his might and strength, the lion lacked wisdom. He was boastful and foolish, often allowing his power to cloud his judgment. I pause, relishing the excited whispers that ripple through the air before raising my hand to quiet them. Then I delve into the tale of the lion's encounters with a seemingly insignificant rabbit. This rabbit, I say, my voice lowering to a conspiratorial whisper, was neither strong nor fearsome. However, it possessed cunning and quick-wittedness. It understood that wit could triumph over strength, that cleverness could outmaneuver brute force. I unfurl the story, describing the rabbit's crafty tactics to outsmart the lion, to make him realize his own folly. I paint vivid images with my words, the lion's proud roars reverberating through the jungle, the rabbit's soft, cunning whispers rustling in the underbrush. The firelight plays upon my animated features, casting long, lively shadows on the ground, breathing life into the tale. Laughter erupts, mingling with sounds of disbelief and nods of understanding. Adults murmur among themselves, drawing parallels between the lion's pride and their own past mistakes. They find wisdom in the rabbit's cleverness, recognizing the strength of patience and perseverance. As I conclude the tale, with the lion humbled and the rabbit triumphant, a lingering silence ensues. The story, simple though it may be, leaves its mark, a spark of contemplation that warms their hearts more than the fire before us. They ponder the moral, the lesson that the humble rabbit imparts to the mighty lion. It is a lesson they carry within, etched deeper by the power of storytelling. The gentle lull of the crackling fire fills the quiet that follows my tale, its fading embers casting a soft glow upon the faces of our tribe. Emotions flicker in their eyes, ranging from reverence to admiration, and in Zulus, a spark of aspiration. Jara, her face weathered yet radiant with wisdom, is the first to break the silence. The blessings of our ancestors flow through you, Tak, she says, her voice resonating with the depth of her faith. You carry their wisdom in your heart and give it voice with your words. A hum of agreement ripples through the gathered crowd, echoing like a shared heartbeat. Even Odrin, the tribe's seasoned hunter known for his stoicism, nods in silent acknowledgement. I want to be a story weaver too, Zulu declares suddenly, his youthful voice brimming with determination. His words break the solemnity of the moment, and laughter bubbles up from the tribe. I simply ruffle my brother's hair, a fond smile dancing on my lips. As long as you don't start weaving tales of how you defeated me in wrestling, I tease, a twinkle in my eyes. Zulu's retort is drowned out in another wave of laughter, his face reddening in the warm glow of the fire. As the night progresses, the fire flickers lower, its light diminishing as tribe members begin to seek solace in the comforting embrace of sleep. They settle around the hearth, the older ones succumbing first, finding solace in the shared warmth. Maeve, my little sister, struggles to keep her eyes open her tiny body swaying with fatigue. I gently guide her down, her head finding a resting place on my lap. Her eyes flutter closed as she sighs contentedly, a faint smile lingering on her lips. I watch over her, my hand gently caressing her hair, lulling her further into slumber. The night envelopes us, the echoes of laughter fading into the cool air. I look upon my tribe, my family. There is a sense of peace, of togetherness. I reflect on my tale, on the foolish lion and the clever rabbit and on the wisdom I seek to impart. I feel the presence of our ancestors, their guidance, and in that quiet moment beneath the starlit sky, I hope I am doing them justice. The dawn of a new day greets our tribe with a gentle caress of sunlight, filtering through the lush canopy above and casting dappled shadows on the earth. I awaken to the sound of my name echoing through the grove, a summons to the council meeting. Casting a fleeting glance at Maeve, still enveloped in the warmth of sleep, I rise to meet the day. Entering the circle of the council, I am met by a gathering of familiar faces etched with wisdom and determination. Elder Akira's crinkled eyes welcome me warmly, while Yenner's steady gaze carries a hint of pride. Odin leans against the nearby tree, his stoic presence undeniably felt. Jara, Garen, and the rest turn their expectant eyes toward me. Tak, Jara begins, her tone filled with appreciation. 
Your wisdom has indeed bestowed great bounty upon us. The earth now yields this crop you call tomatoes, just as it did for our ancestors. We honor your contribution. A wave of gratitude washes over me, and the corners of my mouth lift in a small, humble smile. I only wish to serve our tribe, I reply sincerely. I believe there is more we can do to secure our future. It is Odrin who speaks next, his normally reserved demeanor lending weight to his words. The lad has proposed an idea, one that I believe merits our consideration. He suggests we shift from hunting our prey to capturing them. The idea floats among the council, stirring murmurs of curiosity and uncertainty. Elder Garan, his eyes narrowed in thought, is the first to voice his query. What would be the benefits of such a move, Tack he asks, his gaze piercing yet open. I take a deep breath, my eyes reflecting the embers of conviction. By capturing our prey, we can establish a sustainable source of food and resources. It would reduce the dangers our hunters face on a daily basis. Moreover, it would free us from the cycle of tracking animals' migratory patterns, which disrupts our farming and other aspects of life. Essentially, it offers us stability. The council absorbs my words, their eyes flickering with sparks of realization. It is a new idea, yet it carries the weight of our ancestors' wisdom and the promise of survival. As they contemplate, the sun climbs higher in the sky, signaling the beginning of another day of endurance, another day of striving, another day of evolution, and another day dedicated to securing the resilience of our small tribe. Though your idea seems promising, there are hurdles to overcome, Garan says, folding his arms across his broad chest. His sharp gaze studies me, the lines on his face deepening with his furrowed brows. Capturing the beast is one thing. But how can we ensure they wouldn't just break free and run away they are creatures of the wild, meant to roam freely? Elder Akira, his hair silver in the morning light, nods in agreement. Garan speaks the truth, he adds, his voice soft yet firm. And what of their food if we cage them? We bear the responsibility of their well-being. Are we prepared for such a burden? I meet their gaze, undaunted by their probing questions. These concerns reflect the wisdom and experience of the elders. I understand their fears their desire to honor the balance of nature, and their doubts about the feasibility of my idea. I understand your worries, I begin, my voice steady. We do not wish to harm the creatures or disrupt the course of nature, but we need to adapt to evolve. Capturing doesn't imply confining them to a harsh existence. We can create homes that are spacious enough for them to move and live comfortably. We can mimic their natural environment. The council members exchange glances, their expressions a mixture of apprehension and curiosity. The light dances in their eyes as they contemplate the feasibility of my idea, while the shadows of the overhead foliage paint a mosaic on their faces. As for their food I continue, they can feed on the plants we cultivate and the remnants from our meals. In return, they will provide us with a sustainable food source and other resources, such as hides for our clothing and bones for our tools. A profound silence descends upon the gathering, as deep as the forest that surrounds us. Each elder ponders my words carefully weighing the benefits and sacrifices my idea demands. Yet, deep in their hearts, they understand that survival often requires innovation, adaptation, and the audacity to explore the untried. The council meeting, carried on the open air of our communal space, hums with thoughtful murmurs. Odrin breaks his silence. His face, marked by time and the elements, is solemn as he regards me. The lad's words carry weight, he rumbles, his deep voice resonating like distant thunder. Change has always been our ally. We could venture to try his approach. Elder Akira, the esteemed leader of our tribe, contemplates this. His wise, ancient eyes watch me with a mixture of intrigue and thoughtful reserve. His hands, gnarled and strong from years of leadership, rest calmly and steadily in his lap. You possess a wisdom well beyond your years. Tak, Akira pronounces, his voice as soothing as a calm river, yet as commanding as a roaring waterfall. You have earned the right to see your ideas through. However, we should tread carefully. I meet the elder's gaze and offer a respectful nod. I agree, Elder Akira, I state, a determined glint in my eyes. We should proceed slowly, assessing the viability of each step before progressing further. Akira gives a slow nod, his gaze thoughtful. If this endeavor proves too challenging, we must be prepared to return to our hunting roots. Our survival takes precedence above all else. My reply comes softly yet full of conviction, yes, Elder Akira. But even as we explore this new path, hunting need not cease. Moreover, if we succeed in capturing and taming the animals, we can harvest more than just their meat. We could use their eggs and even their hides for shelter and warmth. This could pave the way for a more self-reliant tribe. 
A long silence fills the space as Akira absorbs my points. Finally, the elder leader nods. You have made your case well, Tak, he concedes. We will proceed with your idea, but caution shall be our guiding principle. As the council meeting concludes, a sense of hopeful anticipation lingers in the air. As the council members disperse, Mako, a broad-shouldered man with a muscular build, approached me. His face carried a cautious curiosity, and his folded arms reflected a hint of wariness. Tack, he began, his tone cautious yet not confrontational. How would we even begin to construct such a place for the animals? I turned to face him, my eyes mirroring a sense of calmness. We start with the basics, Mako, I explained, my hand gesturing abstractly through the air, as if envisioning the construction. We can use sturdy wooden logs to build a fence, reinforcing it with lash vines or sinew. The enclosure would need to be tall and robust, discouraging the animals from attempting to jump over or break through it. Mako's brow furrowed in thought, and he slowly nodded as he digested my explanation. You have given this a lot of thought, he finally admitted, a hint of admiration creeping into his voice. I grinned, a touch of boyish pride on my face. It was necessary. A plan is only as good as the amount of thought put into it. There was a brief pause before Mako spoke again. You know, your last idea had me on edge. But this. He ran a hand through his gruff hair, releasing a sigh. I feel safe here. This place. It's home. The idea of uprooting, starting anew in an unknown place with potential dangers, doesn't sit right with me. I clasped Mako's forearm, a soft smile playing on my lips. That's precisely why I suggested this, Mako. To keep us safe, to preserve our home. My gaze turned toward the distant tree lean, an unspoken dream glimmering within. This is just the beginning. We will thrive, and progress together. As the two of us stood discussing, the ripening fields of food came into view, rows upon rows of burgeoning crops swaying softly in the gentle wind. The sight prompted me to inquire, how is our food situation, Mako? Mako's gaze followed mine, resting upon the fields. A satisfied smile spread across his weathered face. We've got more than enough food. Thanks to your idea of planting, he admitted, scratching his stubbled chin. But it's a blessing and a curse, you know so much food and no proper place to store it all. I considered Mako's words before throwing a suggestion his way. Have you thought about using mud? Mako turned to me with an arched eyebrow. Mud what do you mean? I shrugged, looking thoughtful. I don't know, I confessed. I was just thinking aloud. Mud is soft, and easy to mold. Maybe there's a way we can use it to create something to store the excess food. Mako looked doubtful, but there was a spark of interest in his eyes. Maybe. It's worth considering, he muttered, tapping a finger against his cheek. I smiled inwardly, content. I wanted the people of the tribe to think for themselves, to find their own solutions. I didn't want to be the answer to all their problems. I wanted them to look beyond what was known, just as I did. How will they grow if they keep relying on me, I thought. No, they must learn to solve their problems, to think of possibilities. The thoughts echoed within me a resolution for a better future. The two of us, one young and one old, looked out onto our thriving tribe, our thoughts intertwined in shared dreams and silent pledges. The promise of a new tomorrow hung in the air, as solid and reassuring as the ground beneath our feet. We stood there until the sun began its descent, painting the sky with strokes of orange and purple, marking the end of another day in our lives. Chapter 5 The Task As the first light of dawn bathes our humble abode in a soft, warm glow, I stir in the coziness of my furs. I am Tack, a son filled with determination and a deep sense of responsibility. I gaze at my mother, Aisling, a woman of wisdom and strength, her face marked by the passing of countless seasons. My heart swells with pride as her eyes meet mine, an unspoken understanding passing between us. Do you plan to go hunting today? Tack my mother inquires, her words breaking the serene quietness of the morning. Her eyes search mine, aware of the effort I put into providing for our tribe. Not today, mother, I reply, my gaze fixed on the horizon as the sun begins its daily ascent. My voice remains calm and steady, mirroring the determination that burns within me. I have a new task at hand. Curiosity lights up my mother's expression as she looks at me. And what might that be, she asks, her voice soft yet eager for my response. I'm planning to build a home for animals, mother, I admit, turning to face her. My voice carries a note of conviction, my gaze unwavering. Aisling is taken aback her eyes widening in surprise. But her surprise doesn't overshadow the pride welling up within her. That's a noble task, my son, she says, her voice warm. You can take your brother and sister to help you gather what you need. I nod, my face breaking into a grateful smile. 
Thank you, I reply, my words filled with sincerity. Aisling reaches over, patting my hand gently. Your father would be proud of you, Tack, she says, her voice heavy with emotion. Her eyes hold mine, brimming with warmth and admiration. You're doing so much for our tribe. The day is new, and the tasks ahead are many. As the sun rises higher, casting long shadows in the corners of our dwelling, my mother and I share a quiet moment, basking in the golden light of the morning. Today, a new endeavor begins. My younger siblings, Zulu and Maeve, join me as we prepare for our task. Zulu, with his wild locks of hair, is always eager, his eyes shining with enthusiasm. Maeve, small but fiercely determined, readies herself, mirroring my resolve as her elder brother. We are on the verge of leaving when a familiar voice pierces through the stillness of the morning, capturing our attention. Leora, her vibrant hair gleaming in the sunlight and a basket foraging at her side, approaches us. Where are you all headed? Leora asks, her eyebrows raised in curiosity. Her gaze shifts between the three of us, a playful glint in her eyes. We're searching for fallen logs and vines, I respond, meeting her gaze with a gentle smile. My words flow naturally, my tone friendly. We need them to build a pen for animals. Leora's interest is piqued by my words, her eyes lighting up. She glances down at her foraging basket before looking back at me. Can I join you? She asks, a hopeful smile forming at the corner of her lips. Perhaps your ancestor given luck will help me find more food. My smile widens at her request, my eyes crinkling at the corners. Of course, Leora. We'd be delighted to have you, I reply, my voice filled with sincerity. Zulu and Maeve's faces brighten at Leora's inclusion. They hold great respect for her resourcefulness and welcome her companionship. Together we venture into the forest with my hope being that we will find all that is needed for the task. The forest is a vibrant spectacle of life, alive and teeming with endless possibilities. Patches of sunlight peek through the dense foliage overhead, casting an ethereal pattern of light and shadows on the forest floor. I can see Leora, her basket brimming with an assortment of berries each more lustrous than the last. She seems to have a knack for finding these fruitful pockets amidst the verdant greenery. A genuine smile creeps onto her face every time her hand comes away filled with nature's bounty. As for me, my task is proving to be more of a challenge. I need logs. Not just any logs, but those that are sturdy enough to withstand the strain of a makeshift pen, yet thin enough to be manageable. My eyes scan the forest floor but find nothing fitting the bill. I find myself glancing upward at the thick branches standing high and mighty. If I could somehow cut them down, they would be perfect. But the forest isn't a tool shed, and I've got nothing that can do the job. A slight frown creases my brow at this realization. Yet I don't let it dampen my spirits. I have an unwavering faith in the forest. It has provided for generations before me, and I trust it will for us as well. On the other hand, Zulu and Maeve are brimming with youthful energy scampering around the forest like young squirrels. Their laughter echoes through the woods as they chase each other in the quest for the best vines. I can see the spark in their eyes, this task turning into a game for them. In the heart of the forest, we don't forget to stay cautious. Every heartbeat echoing with the rhythms of nature around us can be a predator. Even though our morning had a rough start, I can't help but feel hopeful for what the day has in store for us. We will find what we need, I am sure of it. Maeve comes running towards me, her small hands clutching a generous bunch of vines. Look, Tak, she exclaims, her face beaming with pride. I can't help but return her wide grin, extending my arm to tousle her hair. Great find, Maeve, I compliment her, examining the vines. They're strong, flexible, exactly what we need. My heart fills with pride for my little sister. However, my gaze is drawn skywards. The once clear blue has been replaced by a tapestry of gray, the clouds pregnant with impending rain. The telltale scent of wet earth seeps into the air, a harbinger of the downpour to come. We need to head back, I announce, looking at the trio surrounding me. It's going to rain soon. But you haven't found any logs yet, Tack, Leora points out, worry creasing her brows. I chuckle softly, shaking my head. I know, I confess, my gaze skirting back to those tantalizing branches overhead. The ones I need are too big for us to carry. Leora looks crestfallen, a touch of guilt washing over her face. I must have used up all your luck finding these berries, she mumbles. I laugh again, this time a hearty sound that ricochets off the surrounding trees. No such thing, Leora, I tell her, placing a hand on her shoulder. Our luck lies in the abundance we found today and the fact we have each other. That's what matters the most. As if on cue, the skies break open, the first drops of rain pattering against the forest canopy. A breeze stirs, rustling the leaves and sending a fresh wave of earthy scent our way. 
It's not long before the droplets escape the leafy umbrella above, spotting our clothes with wet patches. Come on, I say, hefting my empty pack higher on my shoulder. Leora has her basket of berries tucked under one arm, and my brother and sister cling to their handfuls of vines, their wide eyes following the trails the raindrops leave on their skin. We should get back before it gets heavier. And so we set off, our feet squelching in the mud, quickening our pace as the rain starts coming down in earnest. Zulu is laughing, opening his mouth to catch the droplets, while Maeve shrieks with delight when a raindrop lands on her nose. Even Leora can't help the grin that spreads across her face as she watches them. I can't help but think that this, right here, is the picture of life a moment of laughter and joy. It's why I want to do more for the tribe, to secure more of these moments for all of us. But for now, we are happy and together, and that's more than enough. I lead us back towards the village, the laughter of my siblings blending with the rain's music, marking our path back home. We're back, I announce, as we trudge into the heart of the village, our clothes soaked and dripping, our hair plastered to our heads. The rain has rendered the village unusually quiet, with the rest of our tribe taking shelter in their homes. A curl of smoke rises from one of the fires, disappearing into the heavy gray curtain of the rain. Oh, look at you, my mother rushes out from our home, her eyes wide in shock as she takes in our drenched state. Thank the ancestors you've returned. Why were you out so long? Before I can respond, Zulu pipes up, we were helping Tack, Mom. He's going to build an animal pen. My mother turns her gaze to me, her brows furrowing. Now in the rain, I laugh at her bewildered expression. Not in the rain, Mom. Maybe tomorrow or when the sun dries the ground. It started raining on our way back so we can't do anything right now. We have managed to collect some vines. It's a start, right? I motion towards the handful of vines Zulu is clutching. Right, my mother sighs, a soft smile playing on her lips. Just that be more careful next time, all right? I nod, reassuring her with a quick I will. The rain begins to slow, the rhythm softening to a gentle patter against the thatched roofs. And while we didn't find any suitable logs today, I know there's always tomorrow. Tomorrow, we'll try again. For now, I join my mother, Zulu, and made by the fire inside our hut, grateful for the warmth that fights off the chill of the rain. The glow of the fire paints our faces in warm hues as we share our stories from the day. The sound of the rain against our homeless soft comforting backdrop to our words. As the warmth from the fire seeps into my drenched clothes, Zulu breaks the comfortable silence. Tack, he nudges me lightly, tell us a story. I look at him, and then at Maeve, their eager faces reflecting the dancing flames. Then, I glance at Leora, who is carefully placing her basket of berries near the fire to dry. Her eyes meet mine, silently urging me on. A smile tugs at my lips. All right, I concede, my mind already picking out a tale from the recesses of my memory. Have any of you heard of the three little pigs? I watch as confusion creeps into their expressions. Pig Zulu scrunches up his face, like the wild boars. I chuckle, shaking my head. Not exactly. Let me start from the beginning. I clear my throat, looking into the fire. Once upon a time, in a land far away from here, there lived three little pigs. Their wide eyes lock onto me, their anticipation tangible in the dimly lit room. I weave the tale of the three pigs, of straw and wood and brick. I watch as their faces mirror the peaks and troughs of the story, their expressions a canvas of fear, joy, surprise, and relief. The flames flicker, casting long shadows that seem to dance along with my words. The wind whistles outside our home, acting as the perfect sound effect for the big bad wolf huffing and puffing. It's a strange contrast the storm outside and the comforting fire within, the world of the three little pigs in our own. As the story comes to an end, a silence hangs over us, only broken by the rain drumming on our home and the crackling of the fire. And so, I conclude, the three little pigs lived happily ever after, safe and sound in the house made of bricks. Sulu and May stare at me, wide-eyed, the story still weaving its magic around them. Liara's gaze is thoughtful, no doubt mulling over the tale's meaning. As for me, I lean back, watching the fire, the echoes of the three little pigs still resounding in my mind. Stories, after all, have a way of staying with us, of reminding us that, sometimes, wisdom and perseverance can triumph over brute strength. That, much like the third pig, we too can build something enduring and strong not just an animal pen, but a better future for our tribe. The gentle patter of raindrops against our home begins to fade, replaced by the occasional plunk of heavier droplets falling from the branches above. As the storm subsides, two familiar figures emerge from the still-misting outdoors. Yenner, Jara Zulu exclaims, immediately moving to make room for them near the fire. They smile, warmth radiating off them as they step closer. 
Yenner, the tribe's best weaver with a head full of silver curls and eyes that seem to sparkle with unspoken stories, takes a seat. Jara, her complexion wrinkled with wisdom, her demeanor exuding a quiet strength, joins him. Ah, uh, it's cozy in here, Yenner remarks, his hands reaching out to absorb the heat from the fire. And what might be the occasion? We were listening to tax stories, Mae pipes up, her young face gleaming with enthusiasm. Really Jara turns to me, her eyes curious. What was today's tale? Three little pigs, I reply, the corners of my mouth curling upwards. A tale of pigs Yenner queries, a chuckle rolling off his tongue. That's a first. Well, I shrug, it's not just about pigs. It's about making wise choices and standing your ground, even when faced with challenges. Hmm, Jara hums, nodding. An important lesson indeed. And so, we lapse into a comfortable quiet, each of us lost in our thoughts. The rain may have ceased, but its remnants still linger in the chill air. But here, by the fire, enveloped in the soft glow of embers and shared wisdom, there's only warmth. This, I think to myself, is what being part of a tribe feels like to be surrounded by people who care and understand. To be a thread in this beautiful tapestry of shared stories and mutual respect. Yenna strokes his silver beard contemplatively as he gazes into the fire, seemingly lost in the dance of its flames. He has an aura about him, a sense of calm and wisdom that draws you in. Even in his silence, he is an enigmatic storyteller, his silence merely the prelude to a captivating tale. He finally speaks, his voice a low rumble, Have I ever told you the tale of the Moon Maiden? Zulu immediately brightens, leaning closer, his eyes filled with anticipation. No, Yenner. Do tell, he implores. Yenner nods, a small, nostalgic smile playing on his lips. Long ago, when the earth was young, there lived a beautiful maiden who resided in the moon. She was as radiant as the moonlight, with eyes that shimmered like stars, and a voice that was as soft and soothing as a summer breeze. His story unfurls, curling around us like the tendrils of smoke rising from the fire. He talks of the moon maiden, her celestial beauty, her kindness, and the love she held for the earth. He spins the tale of longing and sacrifice, of the moon maiden giving up her immortality for the man she loved, only to be betrayed. As Yenner's words paint vivid pictures in the air, the silence around us deepens. We are entranced, every fiber of our beings attuned to the rise and fall of his voice, the rhythmic cadence of his storytelling. When he finally concludes the tale, there's a stillness, an echo of the story lingering in the air. His words seep into us, filling us with a mix of sorrow and wisdom, a reminder of the double-edged sword that is love. Such a sad tale, Leora whispers, her voice barely audible. Yes, Yenner agrees, his gaze distant, but a necessary one. It teaches us that even the purest of intentions can lead to unintended consequences. The last embers of Yenner's story still smoldered within me as I pulled my cloak tighter around myself, an attempt to ward off the creeping chill. The words echoed in my mind, seeping into my consciousness like ink staining a parchment. Was I not, in my own way, a bit like the moon maiden, trying to change a course that nature itself has said I couldn't help but question myself? A tiny voice, deep within me, nagged at my self-assurance, nibbling at the edges of my conviction. My intentions were pure, I knew, but were they wise was my vision, the vision of a thriving, self-sustaining tribe. Too idealistic was I naively trying to rewrite our destiny attempting to force a different path onto a history that was already in motion. My gaze drifted over the faces of my tribe. Every creased forehead, every lined face bore the imprints of a hard, nomadic life a life dictated by the rhythms of nature. Were we not, as Yenna suggested, a part of this endless cycle were my efforts to alter this way of life in line with the natural order of things. The weight of uncertainty pressed against my chest. The fire before me seemed to mirror my thoughts, flickering unpredictably. But as I watched, the fire endured, its flames dancing resolutely against the night, and I felt a spark of resolve kindle within me. Yes, my intentions might seem lofty, and maybe even a tad presumptuous, but they were rooted in a deep love and concern for my tribe, my people. Much like the moon maiden's love for the earth, my actions were guided by a desire to protect, to nurture, to ensure our survival. With a determined nod, I pushed aside my doubts. There was work to be done, trials to face, a path to forge. And even if the future was uncertain, I was ready to face it, one step at a time. Because to question our actions is human, but to let those questions immobilize us is a failure. After all, progress is born from the ashes of uncertainty. And I was ready to light that pyre. Chapter 6 Animal Pen The new day greeted us with a sky of cloudless blue, the sunlight shimmering on the dew-laden leaves. The forest was slowly waking up, 
and I found myself drawn to the relaxing morning sky. As I followed the curving path, I saw Eamon, who had just come back from his early morning forage, with a basket full of wild fruits and herbs. This was something he rarely did as he normally went out hunting with the others. I decided it was a good time to discuss the location for the animal pen. Eamon. I began, pulling him aside. I wanted to talk about the animal pen I proposed to the council. Eamon turned to me, his blue eyes bright with interest. Yes, Tack, I've been meaning to ask you more about it. It's quite a thought, isn't it a little different from the usual? I know, I acknowledged with a nod, and that's why I need your input. Eamon rubbed his stubbled chin thoughtfully. You're thinking near the river, aren't you? You're right, I said, pointing towards the glittering watercourse. Somewhere close to the river, but also a place where the animals can roam around. Eamon contemplated the thought, his eyes following my pointing finger. I see the sense in that. Water is a crucial resource, but we need to make sure the land is not too marshy. It might make it difficult for the animals. That's what I thought, I confessed. I was considering the high ground on the other side of the stream. It's a bit of a walk, but the soil is firm, and the trees are sparse. It will give them space to move around and not feel restricted. Eamon mulled over my words, his brow creasing as he mentally measured the distances, and evaluated the terrain. After what felt like an eternity, he finally turned to me and nodded. It's a good idea, Tack. A good compromise between the need for water and the need for freedom. The distance might be a bit more, but it will be worth it. I felt a surge of relief. Eamon's approval mattered. His understanding of animals and how they moved was crucial for this project. He was a man of few words, but when he spoke, people listened. Now all that's left is to convince the rest of the tribe, I murmured, a hint of concern lacing my words. Eamon clapped me on the shoulder, a small smile playing on his lips. Don't worry about that, Tack. They will see the wisdom in it. After all, it's for the good of the tribe. And with that, he left me standing there, the early morning sun warming my face, and a renewed sense of purpose kindling in my heart. Eamon's steps halted, and he turned back towards me, his brows knitted in a thoughtful frown. Tack, you've spoken about capturing animals. Have you given any thought to what kind you're aiming for? I paused, my gaze drifting towards the vastness of the surrounding wilderness. I have thought about it, yes, I said slowly. Ideally, something that would provide more than just meat. Eamon crossed his arms over his chest, his expression deepening with curiosity. So, you're thinking about animals that give fur or those that have large horns we can use for crafting? I nodded yes, both if possible. The first step, though, would be figuring out which animals would be easiest to domesticate. It's a new territory for us, and we don't want to take on more than we can handle. Eamon's gaze took on a contemplative look as he weighed my words. Hmm, that's sound thinking, Tack. Now that I consider it, the boars in this region seem relatively docile. They could be a good starting point. They're hardy creatures, too, and could endure the changing seasons. Not to mention, they provide a good amount of meat. His suggestion surprised me, but it made sense. Boars were common, and while I had considered them, I hadn't thought about their hardiness. I felt a surge of gratitude for Eamon's insight. What about the idea of domesticating animals for milk, I asked. Do you think that's feasible? Well, Eamon began, scratching his chin thoughtfully. All animals have milk No, there are those wild animals with small curved horns you call goats. They're nimble creatures, but they could be a good source of milk. Our conversation felt like the kindling of a flame, an idea starting to burn brighter with each spoken word. Eamon's insights brought fresh perspectives, and I felt invigorated by the exchange. Thank you Eamon, I said earnestly. Your insights have given me more to consider. Eamon nodded, we're all in this together, tack. We'll figure this out as we always do, as a tribe. I couldn't help but feel a deep sense of appreciation for Eamon and the tribe that we were part of. Their trust in me spurred my determination to see this through. Our conversation ended, leaving me with much to ponder as the sun rose higher, heralding the new day. Leora I called out as I spotted her dragging a collection of logs behind her. What are you doing weren't you supposed to be out foraging? She paused, brushing away a stray lock of hair that had escaped her braid, and turned to face me, a sheepish smile playing on her lips. I was, she admitted, but I felt bad about taking all your luck yesterday. So, I woke up early today and decided to help you out. I was touched by her kindness. It was a sentiment so typical of Leora, always willing to lend a hand. I had always admired this about her her ability to sense when someone needed help and her readiness to offer it. I, I stammered, I don't know what to say, Leora. You didn't have to. Her smile widened, and her eyes sparkled with warmth. Of course I had to, tack. We look out for each other. I nodded, 
a surge of gratitude swelling within me. Thank you, Liara, I said sincerely. Your kindness means more to me than you know. She shrugged, the tips of her ears turning pink under my earnest gaze. It's nothing, really, she insisted, but her voice held a note of pride. We spent the rest of the day working on the logs Liora found, our conversation flowing as easily as the nearby river. There was a comforting rhythm to our work, punctuated by Liora's laughter and my grateful smiles. As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple, I couldn't help but feel that today was a small victory towards our goal, and I had Leora to thank for it. But how exactly are we going to create a pen? Tack Leora's question hovered in the air between us, heavy with curiosity. Well, I began, raking a hand through my hair. We could lay the logs in a circle, or a square perhaps. The important part is creating a secure perimeter. Using my hands I created the shape of a circle and square to get the point across better. And what about the spaces between the logs, she asked her eyebrows nodding together in confusion. That's the role of the vines, Leora. We'll weave them around and through the logs, binding them tightly together. There will be minimal gaps then. As I explained, I used my hands to mimic the actions, forming a circle with my fingers and then interlacing them to mimic the function of the vines. Leora watched, her eyes narrowing in concentration. But I added, this won't be a one-person job. I'll need more hands to help. Would you? Before I could finish, she nodded eagerly her eyes gleaming with enthusiasm. Absolutely, Tack. We can gather others too. After all, we're all in this together, right? The sound of footsteps rustling through the underbrush interrupted us. I turned to find Joran, the tribal craftsman, approaching us. A smile creased his weathered face, his blue eyes warm and friendly under the brim of his straw hat. I couldn't help but overhear your conversation, he admitted, offering a sheepish smile. The idea of building an animal pen is fascinating. It's different and exciting. My eyebrows lifted, taken aback by his eagerness. Really I mean, we could certainly use the help. He laughed, patting my shoulder reassuringly. Of course, young Tack. After all, isn't it our collective knowledge and effort that keeps the tribe thriving? It was my turn to smile, touched by his willingness. You're absolutely right, Joran. Thank you. With his offer, our little project suddenly seemed a lot more achievable. The anticipation fluttered in my chest like a hummingbird a sense of hope budding within me. Have you given any thought to how you're going to catch the animals? Joran's question pulled me from my momentary reverie. I turned to face him, a thoughtful expression on my face. Yes, I admitted. I've considered building traps that will capture the animals without hurting them. Joran's brows furrowed in curiosity, a stark contrast against his tanned complexion. Traps like snares and nets. I nodded, gesturing with my hands as I explained further. Yes, but not the kind that hurt them. A sort of cage, perhaps, with an entrance but no exit. We could use food as bait. An appreciative look flickered across Joran's face, the corners of his mouth tugging upwards. Interesting. Never heard of this before. I wonder how it will work. We could definitely give it a try. His agreement bolstered my confidence. The first steps towards this new approach were slowly falling into place. With each passing moment, the idea of creating a sustainable way of living was becoming more of a reality. For the first time in a long while, the future looked bright and promising. There's something else, I ventured after a moment, looking into Joran's attentive eyes. The animals we choose to capture. They have to be right. Right how he asked, his expression showing both intrigue and confusion. Well I started, thinking through my words carefully. Some animals might be too dangerous or too hard to contain. We need something relatively peaceful, maybe smaller animals like deer or goats, if we can find any. His gaze wandered for a moment, processing my words. Huh. Deer and goats. And he rubbed his chin thoughtfully. It's a good thought, Tack. Those large creatures are better than wolves and the large beast with fur. We'll need to people scout around, and see what we can find. I agreed, a feeling of relief washing over me. I wasn't sure how others would react to my ideas. But having someone like Joran and Eamon understand and support me was a huge relief. I'll round up a few of the lads, Joran said, giving me a firm pat on the shoulder. We'll start planning how to make these traps and scout for animals tomorrow. It's going to be a long day. Thank you, Joran, I said, looking him in the eye. For believing in this. He shrugged, a soft smile on his lips. Someone's got to push us forward, Tack. I'm glad it's you. With that, he walked off, leaving me alone with my thoughts. I'm not sure when but Leora also disappeared from sight giving me a moment to really think about what was happening. My previous life experience gave me the knowledge needed to push our tribe forward.
I just lacked most of the expertise to do it myself, even if it seemed simple. Day turned to days and days to a week as our little group tirelessly worked on building the pen. It was backbreaking work, and we encountered a plethora of problems. The first hurdle was the sheer physicality of the task. Lifting and moving logs, binding them together with vines, securing them into the ground. It was exhausting work, but we toiled on, taking breaks only when our bodies threatened to give in. One day, while we were trying to secure a particularly obstinate log, Joran sighed in exasperation. We need something stronger to bind these logs, he said, panting heavily. These vines. They're not strong enough. I've noticed, Eamon chimed in, wiping the sweat from his brow. We need something that can withstand the pull and strain. I racked my brain, trying to think of a solution. We'd been so sure that the vines would work, but the truth was proving otherwise. What about? Rawhide I suggested tentatively. Rawhide Joran questioned, raising an eyebrow. Yeah, I said, gaining confidence. It's tough, flexible. It might be stronger than the vines. The men pondered my words, and after a few moments, Eamon nodded. It's worth a try. I'll ask some of the hunters if they can spare some. The days causally passed, and we gradually made progress. The pen began to take shape. It wasn't perfect, but it was ours. And more importantly, it showed people that we could innovate from our ideas. It was a tangible manifestation of our efforts to change, to adapt, and to survive. Throughout this time, our conversations revolved around the project. Each problem we encountered sparked a new discussion, a new brainstorming session. The ideas flew back and forth, heated debates flared up, and resolutions were reached. It wasn't just the pen that was growing and taking shape, it was us, as a team, learning to work together towards a common goal. Weeks passed, and the pen's form emerged more distinctly against the landscape each day. We built a space for the animals, spacious enough for them to move, yet secure enough to keep them from wandering too far. The once arduous task of carrying logs became routine. We learned the best way to bind them with rawhide, figuring out a technique that ensured the tightest and most durable bind. Still, we faced new challenges. As the structure took shape, it was clear we needed to consider shelter from the elements. One particularly warm afternoon, as the sun glared down on us, Joran looked at the pen thoughtfully. How do we keep the animals safe from storms, he asked, shielding his eyes from the sun's intensity. We need to think about a roof of some kind. Leora, who had just arrived with fresh berries, chimed in. Maybe we could weave branches together, cover them with leaves. The leaves will dry and fall off, and the branches will crack over time. I countered, pondering the issue. Silence fell over us as we all contemplated the problem. A solution came to me in a memory, a piece of wisdom passed down through generations. Reads, I finally said, my eyes lighting up. Reads, Joran questioned, just as he had when I first suggested rawhide. Yes, I said, excited now. We can weave them into a thick mat and use them as roofing. They're light, sturdy, and can withstand heavy rain. Eamon nodded, a thoughtful expression on his face. That could work, but where do we find enough reeds? There's a marshland downstream, I responded, my mind already racing with plans. I've seen reeds growing there in abundance. We can collect them, dry them out, and weave them into mats. The group murmured in agreement, the prospect of a solution breathing new life into our tired bodies. The air was thick with renewed energy, a collective understanding that every problem encountered was just another challenge to overcome. Through shared effort and constant communication, we were slowly but surely laying the foundation of a new way of life for our tribe. After several weeks of collective toil and relentless problem solving, the animal pen finally stood complete. An edifice born of innovative ideas, shared labor, and unwavering determination, it was a testament to our tribe's capacity for progress. The pen stood tall and proud against the gentle backdrop of the river. Framed by the verdant lushness of the forest, it looked as though it had always been part of the landscape. Its walls were sturdy, built from fallen logs we had bound with strong, durable rawhide. They formed a spacious area where the animals could roam around in, a sense of freedom maintained within the boundaries. At the top, a woven mat of reeds provided shelter. The greenish hue of the reeds contrasted beautifully with the darker wood, adding to the pen's charm. They were arranged meticulously, leaving no gaps for water or cold air to seep through, their resilience promising to weather storms and heat alike. As we stood admiring our collective achievement, the tribe buzzed with joy. There were smiles all around, a sense of pride in every glance. Leora, who had been instrumental in gathering materials, looked at the pen with wide-eyed admiration. It looks even better than I imagined, she declared, her voice full of awe. Joran, 
who had questioned my ideas initially but later became an unwavering partner in the task, clapped my shoulder proudly. I didn't think we could pull it off, but we did. And it's all thanks to you, Tack, he said with a grateful nod. I laughed lightly, brushing off the sole credit. It was a team effort. We all contributed to it. Without your help, we wouldn't have been able to make it. Eamon, standing tall with his arms crossed, nodded approvingly. We did well. Now, we just need to see if the animals will accept their new home. The mood was jubilant, a well-deserved respite after weeks of hard work. Our shared accomplishment had strengthened our bond, cementing a sense of unity that I hoped would serve us well in the times to come. After all, the pen was just the beginning. Turning to Eamon I asked, have you managed to scout out any suitable animals? Eamon, a man of few words, nodded, his calm eyes reflecting the firelight. Aye, we have. There are a few herds of deer that wander nearby. We've also seen some goats, and wild boars in the forest. His report intrigued me. That's an excellent variety. Do you think we can manage to catch a few without causing them harm? Eamon took a moment to consider my question before responding. It'll be challenging, but we can try. Perhaps we can start with the goats. They're smaller, more manageable. Leora, who was listening in on our conversation, chimed in, her enthusiasm infectious. That's a brilliant idea if we can manage that. We can learn how to handle larger animals over time. Joran, ever the practical thinker, voiced out his concerns. We need to think about their food as well. We can't keep them without a proper plan to feed them. You're right, Joran. I acknowledged his valid point. We need to consider a feeding plan. Maybe some of the plants we've started farming would serve as good fodder. The conversation flowed as easily as the river, ebbing and flowing with ideas and concerns. Our excitement was tempered by the daunting tasks that lay ahead, but we were ready. The pen was the first significant step in the journey, a step towards a future brimming with potential. Chapter 7 First Catch As dawn emerged from the veil of night, our small group of hunters, including myself, Leora, Eamon, and Joran, set off towards the forest's edge. Our mission was not the usual hunt, but an attempt at capture. We were aiming for a goat, one of the less intimidating creatures that roamed the wild expanse. The forest's understory was a maze of ferns, mosses, and a network of roots that felt like ancient veins of the earth under our feet. Birds were stirring, their pre-dawn chorus sounding like an orchestra of flutes, bringing the surrounding wilderness to life. It was a melody that always filled me with a sense of belonging, a rhythm that was as much a part of me as my heartbeat. We had devised a simple yet innovative trap. Using woven reeds and long branches, we'd constructed a sturdy cage, large enough to hold a goat but lightweight to carry. The entrance was rigged with a trigger, and a tripwire that would cause the door to swing shut once the bait was disturbed. The bait in question was a small assortment of our forage fruits and vegetables and homegrown tomatoes, a tantalizing mix that we hoped would appeal to the unsuspecting goat. Eamon had suggested using the overripe ones for their stronger scent, a clever idea that had us nodding in agreement. As we moved quietly, our senses were heightened. Eamon, our most experienced hunter, led the way. His movements were fluid almost like a shadow dancing across the forest floor. His keen eyes scanned the surroundings, and soon enough, he gestured us to halt. He had spotted a small herd of goats grazing leisurely in a clearing ahead. Eamon signaled for us to spread out, while he and I moved to set the trap on a narrow game trail we presumed the goats would use. With our hearts pounding in anticipation, we set the bait and retreated, melting back into the surrounding foliage to watch. The waiting game had begun, our collective breaths held as the symphony of the forest played on around us. We were no longer merely hunters, but pioneers navigating an uncharted territory. Each passing moment was a testimony to patience as we lay concealed, the natural orchestra of the forest holding its breath, waiting in shared anticipation for the outcome of our endeavor. Our trap, a seemingly innocuous arrangement of ripe fruits and vegetables, sat bathed in dappled sunlight, their vivid colors winking invitingly against the dense greenery. A soft rustling echoed from a thicket nearby pulling our focus. The goats, a herd of them, hooves gently padding against the undergrowth, turning into the clearing. My pulse quickened, matched by Eamon's steady gaze. The trap looked inviting, but would the goats find it equally enticing? The leading goat, a creature of considerable health with a mottled coat, detached from the rest. It ambled towards the trap, sniffing at the air, curiosity evident in its gaze. My breath hitched as it neared the trap. Its ears twitched, nose lifting high in the air. Something fell to miss. A gut-wrenching moment of uncertainty followed. Would it retreat? Or would curiosity lure it forward our tribe's future was tied to this moment? Then, driven by hunger or interest, 
the goat ventured forth, stretching its neck towards the blueberries. The tripwire snapped, the cage door swung in anticipation. But not quite quick enough. With a startled bleat and a surprising nimbleness, the goat darted back, avoiding the cage just in the nick of time. The trap, our meticulously planned and eagerly awaited endeavor, had failed. A collective sigh rippled through us, the disappointment heavy in the air. Our return to the village was met with sympathetic silence, our empty-handed entrance a stark contrast to the high hopes we had carried that morning. The animal pen, a testament to our labor and dreams, stood empty. However, it wasn't defeat that filled our hearts, but determination. As the sunset cast long shadows across our village, I could see the resolution in the eyes of our tribe. This was just the hurdle, not the end. We would try again, innovate, and adapt. Tomorrow would bring another chance, another step towards the progress we yearned for. The dim light of the evening fire danced in the faces of my comrades as we sat around it, our minds a may lift of thoughts. The day's unsuccessful hunt weighed heavily on us all, creating an unusual quiet. I guess our trap was not as foolproof as we thought. Eamon finally broke the silence, a rueful smile playing on his lips. He was trying to lighten the atmosphere, and I was grateful for it. We were close though. Joran chimed in, his youthful enthusiasm unquelled. Did you see how that goat almost walked into it? Yes, and how it escaped. Leora replied with a soft laugh, her eyes bright in the firelight. We need to figure out how to make that trap door close faster. That's a good point. I agreed, my mind already churning with ideas. Perhaps we could find a heavier object to act as a counterweight, making the door drop quicker. Mako, the strongest among us, rubbed his chin thoughtfully. We can use some of those large stones by the riverbed. They're heavy enough to act as a counterweight. Sounds like a plan. Eamon agreed, nodding appreciatively at Mako. Zulu, my little brother, who had been listening quietly, finally spoke up. Are we going to try again tomorrow? I turned to look at him, seeing the hope in his eyes. I felt a surge of affection for his unwavering belief in our success. Yes, Zulu, we will try again tomorrow. Good, he said simply, his young face lit up with a grin. I know we can do it. The night ended with laughter and tales of old hunts. The failure of the day was gradually replaced with the promise of a new day. It wasn't just about the trap anymore. It was about our will to persevere, to innovate, to strive for a better future. The fire crackled brightly against the night, a beacon of our unyielding spirit. Tomorrow, we would rise again. The first rays of dawn pierced through the leafy cover, bringing with it the chittering song of the waking forest. As the camp stirred to life, my mother Aisling found me by the fire, the remnants of the previous night's flame winking out. Off to another attempt she asked, her voice a soft morning melody. She always had this gentle touch to everything, a warmth that somehow made even the harshest winters bearable. Yes, we've made some modifications to the trap, I replied, cradling the cup of warm herbal brew she'd handed me. The comforting aroma of herbs wafted up, mingling with the fresh morning air. We're using a heavier counterweight this time. Hopefully it'll work. Aisling's gaze turned thoughtful as she stared at the now tepid ashes. You know, tack. She began, her voice barely above a whisper. Your father thought he was a lot like you. Persistent. Always looking for new ways to do things. He'd have been proud of you. There it was the rare mention of my father, a silent, stoic warrior of a man, lost to us too soon. I could feel my heart swelling with a mixture of sadness and pride. I hope so, Aisling, I replied, my voice thick with emotion, I hope so. She smiled at me, her hand reaching out to caress my cheek, her eyes bright. I believe in you, Tack. Our ancestors watch over you. And remember, even if today doesn't go as planned, don't lose heart. Each failure is but a stepping stone to success. Her words, sincere and filled with faith, filled me with a renewed sense of purpose. Yes, we had failed yesterday, but today was a new day, a new opportunity. Thank you, Aisling. I said, pressing her hand in gratitude. I won't let you down. With that, I gathered my tools and joined my companions, their faces bright under the rising sun. We were ready to face the new day, come what may. As the morning unfurled itself, unfettered by the hushed remnants of night, we set forth our hearts thrumming with the rhythm of purpose. We moved through the greenery, the forest a kaleidoscope of life just awakening from slumber. The sun, ascendant in its celestial throne, painted the world in strokes of gold, making the dew-kissed leaves glisten like precious gems. Amidst the ethereal melody of the forest, our footfalls were muted whispers on the velvety moss. Around us, nature hummed its symphony, a medley of rustling leaves, chirping birds, and the distant lull of the river, unifying into a serene harmony. We'll try the trap at the clearing this time, I told my companions. 
The clearing was an expansive space, bathed in sunlight, speckled with daisies and clover. The green blanket was interrupted by the occasional gray of rocks and the deep brown of the forest soil, lending the vista an earthy charm. Our trap lay in wait, ingeniously concealed within the verdant carpet. With bait of our freshly foraged vegetables, the enticing aroma permeated the air, promising a feast to any creature that stumbled upon it. From our hidden vantage point, we watched, anticipation intermingling with attention, forming an intoxicating cocktail of emotions. With bated breath, we waited for our unsuspecting quarry, the hours slipping away as the sun traced its arc across the clear cerulean canvas. Under the tranquil canopy of leaves, we whispered stories to each other, the words ebbing and flowing like the rhythm of our hearts, the tales as ancient as the stars, and yet, as fresh as the morning dew. In this serene communion with nature, with each other, we found ourselves observing a picture that words seldom capture. As the day unfolded, with its myriad hues and symphonies, we continued our watch. As the forest breathed around us, its spirit intertwined with ours, I couldn't help but marvel at the beauty of it all. Undisturbed by human touch, as the sun began to dip below the horizon, painting the sky with fiery streaks of orange, crimson, and violet, the day's labor began to seep into our bones. Fatigue wrapped around us like a comforting shroud, making every step heavier, every breath more labored. Well, started Odrin, breaking the quietude with his deep, resonant voice, it seems our visitors are not in the mood for our hospitality today. His words dripped with gentle humor, his eyes sparkling with an unspoken challenge. The clearing remained quiet, the trap untouched. I chuckled, stretching my aching muscles, perhaps our food does not suit their tastes. The atmosphere turned light with our banter, the disappointment of the day softening under the veil of camaraderie. As we dismantled the trap under the blanket of the approaching night, the air grew cooler, sending a shiver down my spine. The forest, once vibrant and teeming with life, now lay shrouded in silence, its inhabitants retreating into the shadows, surrendering to the encroaching darkness. We'll try again tomorrow, said Mako, determination seeping through his words, the promise of a new day bringing renewed hope. Returning to the tribe, the embers of our shared hearth welcomed us, the dancing flames mirroring the resilience in our hearts. As we sat around the fire, the day's tale unfolded, our voices weaving the story into the tapestry of our shared history. Despite the fruitless endeavor, our spirits remained untarnished, for we knew, in this dance of survival, every step was a lesson, every fall a chance to rise again. Under the canvas of the starlit sky, we found comfort in the fire's warmth. As the hazy fingers of morning light began to brush away the remnants of the night, the tribe was already bustling with activity. I noticed Elder Akra approaching, a thoughtful expression creasing his weathered features. I stood, respecting the gravity of his presence. Tack, he began, his voice carrying the weight of his years, tell me, how is your progress? I could sense the undercurrent of doubt woven into his words, an unspoken apprehension that gnawed at the edges of my resolve. Elder, our efforts have yet to bear fruit, I confessed, keeping my tone steady, my gaze unwavering. The goats avoided our trap yesterday. The elder stroked his grizzled beard, his eyes contemplating the unseen horizon. His silence was like the calm before a storm, and it took all my resolve to not squirm under his scrutinous gaze. Maybe he finally spoke, his voice an echo in the morning's tranquility. Now is not the time for this, tack. His words, laced with a soft yet firm rebuke, hit me harder than I had expected. My mind reeled, struggling to maintain its foothold in the face of his doubt. Elder Akra, I began, steadying my voice, I understand your concern, but I firmly believe in this. We have learned much from our failures, and we will continue learning until we succeed. His eyes, hardened by countless winters, met mine, the silence stretching between us, as if testing the strength of my resolve. Every endeavor has its time, tack, he replied, his voice softer now, carrying a note of understanding. Do not rush the river, it flows at its own pace. As the elder walked away, leaving me with his wisdom, I stood rooted to the ground. His words echoed in my mind reminding me of the inherent wisdom of nature. Maybe he was right. Maybe we were pushing against the flow, forcing a change that wasn't meant to happen just yet. Yet, the flame of belief still flickered within me, refusing to be extinguished. The path ahead was unclear, riddled with uncertainty, yet I knew in my heart, we were onto something, a shift that could change our lives forever. The morning stretched into a clear and warm afternoon, the sun hanging high in the azure expanse above us. It was just me, my siblings, and Leora venturing into the wilderness, the other tribe members either busy with their chores or out hunting. Is everyone ready? I asked, 
hoisting my pack onto my shoulders. Sulu, his youthful energy bounding, gave me a quick nod, his eyes brimming with eagerness. Maeve, despite being young, wore a determined look, echoing Zulu's excitement. Leora, with her foraging basket on her arm, smiled gently at me, her quiet strength always a source of comfort. We're all set, Tack, Leora responded, her eyes shimmering with a subtle sense of adventure. She always had a way of turning everyday tasks into exciting quests, her optimism infectious. We made our way into the forest, the rustling leaves whispering ancient secrets, the chirping of the birds offering a soothing rhythm to our journey. Each step took us deeper into the realm of the unknown, every footfall echoing the unspoken promise of discovery. As we ventured further, we fell into an easy rhythm, the silence of the forest swallowing our words. Our focus was on the task at hand. We moved like a well-coordinated unit, each fulfilling a role, be it scouting, collecting, or keeping an eye out for any potential dangers. Despite the inherent seriousness of our mission, we chatted away with ease. Our conversations were light, full of laughter, and playful banter. As the afternoon waned into early evening, we found ourselves navigating the wild landscape with renewed energy. Despite the elders' doubts and the previous day's failure, we were resolved to see success come our way. Sulu, make sure to stay close, I gently reminded my brother, who had the habit of straying far when absorbed in the scenery. I know, Tack, I know, he retorted, a hint of mischief in his eyes, before he dashed off to examine a cluster of vibrant wildflowers. Can't keep him still, can you Leora chuckled lightly, her eyes following Zulu as he darted from one spot to another. I try, I laughed, but it's like trying to stop the wind. We continued on in comfortable silence for a while, until Maeve's voice broke through carrying an uncharacteristic tone of worry. Tack, what if we can't catch any goats again, she asked, her eyes wide and earnest. What if the elders are right? I looked at my younger sister, her usually carefree demeanor replaced with genuine concern. I crouched down beside her, placing a reassuring hand on her small shoulder. Sometimes, I started, success doesn't come immediately. Sometimes, we have to try and fail many times before we find the right path. But remember, Every failure brings us one step closer to success. And as long as we have each other, we can face anything that comes our way. And if the elders are right, Maeve pushed further, a stubborn wrinkle on her forehead. If the elders are right, we'll admit it and learn from it. But for now, let's focus on doing our best. Can we do that? I offered her a smile, which she mirrored after a moment. Okay, Tack. I believe you, she said, the hint of concern fading from her eyes. I patted her shoulder reassuringly, rising back to my feet. Sulu had wandered back, and Leora was watching the exchange with a tender smile. All right team, let's get back to work, I announced, and we pressed on. We worked through the day, in sync with one another, each of us playing our parts diligently. Zulu and Maeve, the youngest of our group, were in charge of setting the trap. They had the energy and agility needed to sprint through the undergrowth and assemble the trapping mechanisms. Leora, with her knowledge of plants, selected the best vegetation to use as bait and I was in charge of overseeing it all, making sure that everything was executed as planned. As the day wore on, the forest hummed with life. Birds flitted from tree to tree, singing their endless songs, and small critters skittered around, adding to the chorus of sounds. The sunlight filtered through the canopy of leaves, casting an ethereal glow on the forest floor. We made our first attempt at capturing a goat in the late afternoon. With bated breath, we watched as a young goat, its coat a dusty gray color, approached the cage. Lured in by the sweet-smelling vegetation, it walked right into our trap. However, the cage didn't close as it was supposed to. The mechanism failed, and the goat scampered away, its hooves drumming against the earth in a rhythmic retreat. There was a moment of silence following the failed attempt. We looked at each other, disappointment weighing heavy in the air, but we didn't let it deter us. Instead, it ignited a fire within us. We fixed the faulty mechanism and reset the trap, patiently waiting for another opportunity. As the sun began to set, painting the sky with hues of orange and pink, we gathered our things and decided to head back. Nothing else was drawn in by our newly placed bait, leaving us to return home empty-handed. Tomorrow is another day, I said, breaking the silence. We'll try again. The others nodded in agreement. As we journeyed back to the tribe settlement, the warmth of the setting sun on my face had me reflecting on the task. The forest, once filled with harmonious sounds, had faded into a gentle hum as dusk approached. My eyes scanned the horizon, a vibrant painting of reds and purples, and my thoughts started to circle back to the elder's words. I was walking alongside my siblings, Leora trailing just a bit behind us. Their faces, 
usually animated with youthful enthusiasm, bore a look of quiet contemplation. They were probably reflecting on the day's events, just as I was. The elder's skeptical voice echoed in my mind. Maybe now is not the time for this, he had said. Those words had initially sparked a defensiveness within me, a determination to prove him wrong. But now, in the quiet of the evening, doubts started to creep in. Had we been too hasty in trying to adopt this new method had we overlooked something crucial? I shook my head, trying to clear the encroaching doubts. Every change brought its own set of challenges, I reminded myself. I had to stay strong, not just for me, but for everyone who believed in this vision. Tack, Leora called, her voice breaking through my thoughts. She had caught up and was looking at me with concern. You're quiet. Are you okay? I turned to look at her, her face half illuminated by the dwindling daylight. Yes, just thinking, I replied, offering her a small, reassuring smile. Change was always difficult, I realized, but it was not insurmountable. Our first failure was a lesson learned, and we would take it in stride. We just had to adapt to make sure we saw success the next time. After all, wasn't that the essence of survival? The forest quietude was punctuated by Maeve's innocent voice, her eyes glistening with anticipation. Tack, tell us a story, please. Her request stirred a warm smile on my face as I glanced over at her. All right, have I ever told you about the hugging tree I asked, catching their curious gazes. The hugging tree my little brother, Zulu echoed, his brows furrowing together in thought. No, I don't think so. Well, I began, slowing my pace a bit as I gathered my thoughts. Long ago, when the world was still new, and trees could speak, there was a tree unlike any other. Every tree in the forest stood tall and proud, reaching for the sky but this one tree was different. It bent low to the ground, its branches stretched wide and welcoming. This tree loved to embrace all who came to it, wrapping them in its gentle branches. Hence, it became known as the hugging tree. Did it hug everyone? Liara asked, her eyes wide with fascination. Absolutely, I replied, my voice dipped in soft nostalgia. It welcomed every creature, big or small, with a loving hug. The hugging tree became a symbol of love and acceptance. But why did it hug? Zulu interjected his voice full of innocent curiosity. I chuckled lightly at his question. Well, the hugging tree believed that love and kindness were the greatest gifts it could offer. And in sharing these gifts, it hoped to create a world where all beings felt cherished and loved. There was silence as my siblings absorbed the story, their faces a canvas of thoughtful contemplation. I hoped they understood the underpinning message of the tale, one that stressed the importance of compassion and kindness. Amidst our struggles, it was crucial to remember the power of love and how it could help even in the hardest of times. Memories of a past where men and women lacked empathy towards one another came forward. It was a hard time to live as people stepped over one another for their own self-goals, bringing others down just to have a faint feeling of happiness in their life. I hoped we would never become like that. The following day the four of us went out again, this time even more determined to succeed. Success only partially lay with us for we needed luck on our side. Our past failures still fresh in our mind caused us to understand that trying something new was not always easy. Even I with my knowledge was not all-knowing. I was learning, adapting, and evolving just like the rest of my tribe in the hope for a better tomorrow. As we ventured deeper into the woods, the forest hummed its melody, harmonizing with the chorus of creatures whispering secrets. The sun's rays were sifting through the foliage, casting a gentle warmth upon us as if echoing the sentiments of the hugging tree. The story had sparked an intimate, tranquil ambience, with only the occasional rustle of leaves and distant bird calls punctuating the serene silence. We should be like the hugging tree, Maeve eventually broke the silence, her voice imbued with newfound determination. We should keep trying, no matter what, right tack. Her words resonated within me, her youthful optimism a bomb to my doubt-infested mind. I glanced at her, my heart swelling with a concoction of pride and affection. Absolutely, Maeve, I replied, squeezing her hand gently. We should always try our best, regardless of how many times we may stumble. Our little procession carried on, with my siblings and Leora determinately scouting the surroundings. The occasional smile or shared glance echoed the renewed determination we felt, spurred on by the story of the hugging tree. It reminded us that resilience was a defining trait of nature, and just as the hugging tree stood unyielding in its love and kindness, we too needed to persevere in our endeavor. As we arrived at the site of our previous unsuccessful attempt, I felt a pang of hope surge within me. The trap lay ahead, silent, still and inviting. The scent of fresh fruits and vegetables wafted through the air, a tantalizing allure for any creature. Casting my lingering doubts aside, I set my resolve, 
turning to face my companions. All right, I declared, my voice firm. Let's give this another try. Their eyes shone back at me, brimming with determination, reflecting the spirit of the hugging tree, a testament to our enduring resolve. Under the morning sun's radiant glow, we crouched near the trap, our breath held as we awaited the imminent moment. The wind rustled through the trees, its whispers barely audible above the pounding of our hearts. Suddenly, a rustle from the bushes seized our attention. The faint crunch of leaves under soft footfalls approached our trap, our hearts thrumming in our chests. Out from the greenery emerged a wild goat, its eyes curiously scanning the surroundings before landing on the fruits and vegetables laid out enticingly in the cage. We watched, scarcely daring to breathe as the goat advanced cautiously towards the cage. Its nostrils flared, sniffing the air before stepping inside the cage. As if in slow motion, we watched the door of the cage fall shut, the unmistakable sound of success echoing in our ears. A wave of exhilaration washed over us as we leapt to our feet, our shouts of triumph piercing the air. Maeve and Zulu were jumping around, their young faces painted with pure joy while Leora's radiant smile outshone the sun itself. We did it. Tack we really did it Maeve cried out, her laughter mixing with the morning chorus of the birds. See, I told you we're lucky Zulu chimed in, his eyes sparkling with pride. Leora simply stood there, her smile mirroring the relief and triumph washing over me. It's because we didn't give up she finally managed to say, her voice brimming with pride and excitement. Their celebration echoed around me, a melodious symphony of success, reminding me once again why I had taken up this seemingly impossible task. I looked at the goat, now curiously munching on the vegetables in the cage, its unwitting participation in our grand scheme symbolizing the successful task in order to change us from hunter-gatherers into a society that grew its own food. I couldn't help but think back to the elders' doubts, to my own wavering faith. But as I stood there, amidst the victorious laughter and the thriving life of the wilderness, I realized that we had done more than just trap a goat. This was not just our success. It was a victory for our tribe. It was the birth of a new way, a new path, carved not just by our hands but by our hearts and minds. With a smile stretching across my face, I joined in their laughter, the sound of our shared joy echoing through the forest, a song of triumph sung by the victorious underdogs. Yes, we did it. I finally said together, we did it. Chapter 8, Teacher. Next. As dawn emerged from the veil of night, our small group of hunters, including myself, Leora, Eamon, and Joran, set off towards the forest edge. Our mission was not the usual hunt, but an attempt at capture. We were aiming for a goat, one of the less intimidating creatures that roamed the wild expanse. The forest's understory was a maze of ferns, mosses, and a network of roots that felt like ancient veins of the earth under our feet. Birds were stirring, their pre-dawn chorus sounding like an orchestra of flutes, bringing the surrounding wilderness to life. It was a melody that always filled me with a sense of belonging, a rhythm that was as much a part of me as my heartbeat. We had devised a simple yet innovative trap. Using woven reeds and long branches, we'd constructed a sturdy cage, large enough to hold a goat but lightweight to carry. The entrance was rigged with a trigger and a tripwire that would cause the door to swing shut once the bait was disturbed. The bait in question was a small assortment of our foraged fruits and vegetables and homegrown tomatoes, a tantalizing mix that we hoped would appeal to the unsuspecting goat. Eamon had suggested using the overripe ones for their stronger scent, a clever idea that had us nodding in agreement. As we moved quietly, our senses were heightened. Eamon, our most experienced hunter, led the way. His movements were fluid, almost like a shadow dancing across the forest floor. His keen eyes scanned the surroundings, and soon enough, he gestured us to halt. He had spotted a small herd of goats grazing leisurely in a clearing ahead. Eamon signaled for us to spread out, while he and I moved to set the trap on a narrow game trail we presumed the goats would use. With our hearts pounding in anticipation, we set the bait and retreated, melting back into the surrounding foliage to watch. The waiting game had begun, our collective breaths held, as the symphony of the forest played on around us. We were no longer merely hunters, but pioneers navigating an uncharted territory. Each passing moment was a testimony to patience as we lay concealed, the natural orchestra of the forest holding its breath, waiting in shared anticipation for the outcome of our endeavor. Our trap, a seemingly innocuous arrangement of ripe fruits and vegetables, sat bathed in dappled sunlight, their vivid colors winking invitingly against the dense greenery. A soft rustling echoed from a thicket nearby, pulling our focus. The goats, a herd of them, hooves gently padding against the undergrowth, turning into the clearing. My pulse quickened matched by Eamon's steady gaze. The trap looked inviting, 
but would the goats find it equally enticing? The leading goat, a creature of considerable health with a mottled coat, detached from the rest. It ambled towards the trap, sniffing at the air, curiosity evident in its gaze. My breath hitched as it neared the trap. Its ears twitched, nose lifting high in the air. Something felt amiss. A gut-wrenching moment of uncertainty followed. Would it retreat? Or would curiosity lure it forward our tribe's future was tied to this moment? Then, driven by hunger or interest, the goat ventured forth, stretching its neck towards the blueberries. The tripwire snapped, the cage door swung in anticipation. But not quite quick enough. With a startled bleat and a surprising nimbleness, the goat darted back, avoiding the cage just in the nick of time. The trap, our meticulously planned and eagerly awaited endeavor, had failed. A collective sigh rippled through us, the disappointment heavy in the air. Our return to the village was met with sympathetic silence, our empty-handed entrance a stark contrast to the high hopes we had carried that morning. The animal pen, a testament to our labor and dreams, stood empty. However, it wasn't defeat that filled our hearts, but determination. As the sunset cast long shadows across our village, I could see the resolution in the eyes of our tribe. This was just a hurdle, not the end. We would try again, innovate, and adapt. Tomorrow would bring another chance, another step towards the progress we yearned for. The dim light of the evening fire danced in the faces of my comrades as we sat around it, our minds a maylift of thoughts. The day's unsuccessful hunt weighed heavily on us all, creating an unusual quiet. I guess our trap was not as foolproof as we thought. Eamon finally broke the silence, a rueful smile playing on his lips. He was trying to lighten the atmosphere, and I was grateful for it. We were close though. Joran chimed in, his youthful enthusiasm unquelled. Did you see how that goat almost walked into it? Yes, and how it escaped. Leora replied with a soft laugh, her eyes bright in the firelight. We need to figure out how to make that trap door close faster. That's a good point. I agreed, my mind already churning with ideas. Perhaps we could find a heavier object to act as a counterweight, making the door drop quicker. Mako, the strongest among us, rubbed his chin thoughtfully. We can use some of those large stones by the riverbed. They're heavy enough to act as a counterweight. Sounds like a plan. Eamon agreed, nodding appreciatively at Mako. Zulu, my little brother, who had been listening quietly, finally spoke up. Are we going to try again tomorrow? I turned to look at him, seeing the hope in his eyes. I felt a surge of affection for his unwavering belief in our success. Yes, Zulu, we will try again tomorrow. Good, he said simply. His young face lit up with a grin. I know we can do it. The night ended with laughter and tales of old hunts. The failure of the day was gradually replaced with the promise of a new day. It wasn't just about the trap anymore. It was about our will to persevere, to innovate, to strive for a better future. The fire crackled brightly against the night, a beacon of our unyielding spirit. Tomorrow, we would rise again. The first rays of dawn pierced through the leafy cover, bringing with it the chittering song of the waking forest. As the camp stirred to life, my mother Aisling found me by the fire, the remnants of the previous night's flame winking out. Off to another attempt she asked, her voice a soft morning melody. She always had this gentle touch to everything, a warmth that somehow made even the harshest winters bearable. Yes, we've made some modifications to the trap, I replied, cradling the cup of warm herbal brew she'd handed me. The comforting aroma of herbs wafted up, mingling with the fresh morning air. We're using a heavier counterweight this time. Hopefully it'll work. Aisling's gaze turned thoughtful as she stared at the now tepid ashes. You know, tack. She began, her voice barely above a whisper, your father. He was a lot like you, persistent, always looking for new ways to do things. He'd have been proud of you. There it was the rare mention of my father, a silent, stoic warrior of a man, lost to us too soon. I could feel my heart swelling with a mixture of sadness and pride. I hope so, Aisling, I replied, my voice thick with emotion, I hope so. She smiled at me, her hand reaching out to caress my cheek, her eyes bright. I believe in you, Tack. Our ancestors watch over you. And remember, even if today doesn't go as planned, don't lose heart. Each failure is but a stepping stone to success. Her words, sincere and filled with faith, filled me with a renewed sense of purpose. Yes, we had failed yesterday, but today was a new day, a new opportunity. Thank you, Aisling. I said, pressing her hand in gratitude. I won't let you down. With that, I gathered my tools and joined my companions, their faces bright under the rising sun. We were ready to face the new day, come what may. As the morning unfurled itself, unfettered by the hushed remnants of night, we set forth, our hearts thrumming with the rhythm of purpose. We moved through the greenery, 
the forest a kaleidoscope of life just awakening from slumber. The sun, ascendant in its celestial throne, painted the world in strokes of gold, making the dew-kissed leaves glisten like precious gems. Amidst the ethereal melody of the forest, our footfalls were muted whispers on the velvety moss. Around us, nature hummed its symphony, a medley of rustling leaves, chirping birds, and the distant lull of the river, unifying into a serene harmony. We'll try the trap at the clearing this time, I told my companions. The clearing was an expanse of space, bathed in sunlight, speckled with daisies and clover. The green blanket was interrupted by the occasional gray of rocks and the deep brown of the forest soil, lending the vista an earthy charm. Our trap lay in wait, ingeniously concealed within the verdant carpet. With bait of our freshly foraged vegetables, the enticing aroma permeated the air, promising a feast to any creature that stumbled upon it. From our hidden vantage point, we watched, anticipation intermingling with attention, forming an intoxicating cocktail of emotions. With bated breath, we waited for our unsuspecting quarry, the hours slipping away as the sun traced its arc across the clear cerulean canvas. Under the tranquil canopy of leaves, we whispered stories to each other, the words ebbing and flowing like the rhythm of our hearts, the tales as ancient as the stars, and yet, as fresh as the morning dew. In this serene communion with nature, with each other, we found ourselves observing a picture that words seldom capture. As the day unfolded, with its myriad hues and symphonies, we continued our watch. As the forest breathed around us, its spirit intertwined with ours, I couldn't help but marvel at the beauty of it all. Undisturbed by human touch, as the sun began to dip below the horizon, painting the sky with fiery streaks of orange, crimson, and violet, the day's labor began to seep into our bones. Fatigue wrapped around us like a comforting shroud, making every step heavier, every breath more labored. Well, started Odrin, breaking the quietude with his deep, resonant voice, it seems our visitors are not in the mood for our hospitality today. His words dripped with gentle humor, his eyes sparkling with an unspoken challenge. The clearing remained quiet, the trap untouched. I chuckled, stretching my aching muscles, perhaps our food does not suit their tastes. The atmosphere turned light with our banter, the disappointment of the day softening under the veil of camaraderie. As we dismantled the trap under the blanket of the approaching night, the air grew cooler, sending a shiver down my spine. The forest, once vibrant and teeming with life, now lay shrouded in silence, its inhabitants retreating into the shadows, surrendering to the encroaching darkness. We'll try again tomorrow, said Mako, determination seeping through his words, the promise of a new day bringing renewed hope. Returning to the tribe, the embers of our shared hearth welcomed us, the dancing flames mirroring the resilience in our hearts. As we sat around the fire, the day's tale unfolded, our voices weaving the story into the tapestry of our shared history. Despite the fruitless endeavor, our spirits remained untarnished, for we knew, in this dance of survival, every step was a lesson, every fall a chance to rise again. Under the canvas of the starlit sky, we found comfort in the fire's warmth. As the hazy fingers of morning light began to brush away the remnants of the night, the tribe was already bustling with activity. I noticed Elder Akra approaching, a thoughtful expression creasing his weathered features. I stood, respecting the gravity of his presence. Tack, he began, his voice carrying the weight of his years, tell me, how is your progress? I could sense the undercurrent of doubt woven into his words, an unspoken apprehension that gnawed at the edges of my resolve. Elder, our efforts have yet to bear fruit, I confessed, keeping my tone steady, my gaze unwavering. The goats avoided our trap yesterday. The elder stroked his grizzled beard, his eyes contemplating the unseen horizon. His silence was like the calm before a storm, and it took all my resolve to not squirm under his scrutinous gaze. Maybe he finally spoke, his voice an echo in the morning's tranquility, now is not the time for this, tack. His words, laced with a soft yet firm rebuke, hit me harder than I had expected. My mind reeled, struggling to maintain its foothold in the face of his doubt. Elder Akira, I began, steadying my voice, I understand your concern, but I firmly believe in this. We have learned much from our failures, and we will continue learning until we succeed. His eyes, hardened by countless winters, met mine, the silence stretching between us, as if testing the strength of my resolve. Every endeavor has its time, tack, he replied, his voice softer now, carrying a note of understanding. Do not rush the river, it flows at its own pace. As the elder walked away, leaving me with his wisdom, I stood rooted to the ground. His words echoed in my mind reminding me of the inherent wisdom of nature. Maybe he was right. Maybe we were pushing against the flow, 
forcing a change that wasn't meant to happen just yet. Yet, the flame of belief still flickered within me, refusing to be extinguished. The path ahead was unclear, riddled with uncertainty, yet I knew in my heart, we were onto something, a shift that could change our lives forever. The morning stretched into a clear and warm afternoon, the sun hanging high in the azure expanse above us. It was just me, my siblings, and Leora venturing into the wilderness, the other tribe members either busy with their chores or out hunting. Is everyone ready? I asked, hoisting my pack onto my shoulders. Sulu, his youthful energy bounding, gave me a quick nod, his eyes brimming with eagerness. Maeve, despite being young, wore a determined look, echoing Zulu's excitement. Leora, with her foraging basket on her arm, smiled gently at me, her quiet strength always a source of comfort. We're all set, Tack, Leora responded, her eyes shimmering with a subtle sense of adventure. She always had a way of turning everyday tasks into exciting quests, her optimism infectious. We made our way into the forest, the rustling leaves whispering ancient secrets, the chirping of the birds offering a soothing rhythm to our journey. Each step took us deeper into the realm of the unknown, every footfall echoing the unspoken promise of discovery. As we ventured further, we fell into an easy rhythm, the silence of the forest swallowing our words. Our focus was on the task at hand. We moved like a well-coordinated unit, each fulfilling a role, be it scouting, collecting, or keeping an eye out for any potential dangers. Despite the inherent seriousness of our mission, we chatted away with ease. Our conversations were light, full of laughter, and playful banter. As the afternoon waned into early evening, we found ourselves navigating the wild landscape with renewed energy. Despite the elders' doubts and the previous day's failure, we were resolved to see success come our way. Sulu, make sure to stay close, I gently reminded my brother, who had the habit of straying far when absorbed in the scenery. I know, Tack, I know, he retorted, a hint of mischief in his eyes, before he dashed off to examine a cluster of vibrant wildflowers. Can't keep him still, can you? Leora chuckled lightly, her eyes following Zulu as he darted from one spot to another. I try, I laughed, but it's like trying to stop the wind. We continued on in comfortable silence for a while, until Maeve's voice broke through carrying an uncharacteristic tone of worry. Tack, what if we can't catch any goats again? She asked, her eyes wide and earnest. What if the elders are right? I looked at my younger sister, her usually carefree demeanor replaced with genuine concern. I crouched down beside her, placing a reassuring hand on her small shoulder. Sometimes, I started, success doesn't come immediately. Sometimes, we have to try and fail many times before we find the right path. But remember, Every failure brings us one step closer to success. And as long as we have each other, we can face anything that comes our way. And if the elders are right, Maeve pushed further, a stubborn wrinkle on her forehead. If the elders are right, we'll admit it and learn from it. But for now, let's focus on doing our best. Can we do that? I offered her a smile, which she mirrored after a moment. Okay, Tack. I believe you, she said, the hint of concern fading from her eyes. I patted her shoulder reassuringly, rising back to my feet. Sulu had wandered back, and Leora was watching the exchange with a tender smile. All right team, let's get back to work, I announced, and we pressed on. We worked through the day, in sync with one another, each of us playing our parts diligently. Zulu and Maeve, the youngest of our group, were in charge of setting the trap. They had the energy and agility needed to sprint through the undergrowth and assemble the trapping mechanisms. Leora, with her knowledge of plants, selected the best vegetation to use as bait and I was in charge of overseeing it all, making sure that everything was executed as planned. As the day wore on, the forest hummed with life. Birds flitted from tree to tree, singing their endless songs, and small critters skittered around, adding to the chorus of sounds. The sunlight filtered through the canopy of leaves, casting an ethereal glow on the forest floor. We made our first attempt at capturing a goat in the late afternoon. With bated breath, we watched as a young goat, its coat a dusty gray color, approached the cage. Lured in by the sweet-smelling vegetation, it walked right into our trap. However, the cage didn't close as it was supposed to. The mechanism failed, and the goat scampered away, its hooves drumming against the earth in a rhythmic retreat. There was a moment of silence following the failed attempt. We looked at each other, disappointment weighing heavy in the air. But we didn't let it deter us. Instead, it ignited a fire within us. We fixed the faulty mechanism and reset the trap, patiently waiting for another opportunity. As the sun began to set, painting the sky with hues of orange and pink, we gathered our things and decided to head back. Nothing else was drawn in by our newly placed bait, leaving us to return home empty-handed. 
Tomorrow is another day, I said, breaking the silence. We'll try again. The others nodded in agreement. As we journeyed back to the tribe's settlement, the warmth of the setting sun on my face had me reflecting on the task. The forest, once filled with harmonious sounds, had faded into a gentle hum as dusk approached. My eyes scanned the horizon, a vibrant painting of reds and purples, and my thoughts started to circle back to the elders' words. I was walking alongside my siblings, Leora trailing just a bit behind us. Their faces, usually animated with youthful enthusiasm, bore a look of quiet contemplation. They were probably reflecting on the day's events, just as I was. The elder's skeptical voice echoed in my mind. Maybe now is not the time for this, he had said. Those words had initially sparked a defensiveness within me, a determination to prove him wrong. But now, in the quiet of the evening, doubts started to creep in. Had we been too hasty in trying to adopt this new method had we overlooked something crucial? I shook my head, trying to clear the encroaching doubts. Every change brought its own set of challenges, I reminded myself. I had to stay strong, not just for me, but for everyone who believed in this vision. Tack, Leora called, her voice breaking through my thoughts. She had caught up and was looking at me with concern. You're quiet. Are you okay? I turned to look at her, her face half illuminated by the dwindling daylight. Yes, just thinking, I replied, offering her a small, reassuring smile. Change was always difficult, I realized, but it was not insurmountable. Our first failure was a lesson learned, and we would take it in stride. We just had to adapt to make sure we saw success the next time. After all, wasn't that the essence of survival? The forest quietude was punctuated by Maeve's innocent voice, her eyes glistening with anticipation. Tack, tell us a story, please. Her request stirred a warm smile on my face as I glanced over at her. All right, have I ever told you about the hugging tree I asked, catching their curious gazes. The hugging tree my little brother, Zulu echoed, his brows furrowing together in thought. No, I don't think so. Well, I began, slowing my pace a bit as I gathered my thoughts, long ago, when the world was still new and trees could speak, there was a tree unlike any other. Every tree in the forest stood tall and proud, reaching for the sky, but this one tree was different. It bent low to the ground, its branches stretched wide and welcoming. This tree loved to embrace all who came to it, wrapping them in its gentle branches. Hence, it became known as the hugging tree. Did it hug everyone? Liara asked, her eyes wide with fascination. Absolutely, I replied, my voice dipped in soft nostalgia. It welcomed every creature, big or small, with a loving hug. The hugging tree became a symbol of love and acceptance. But why did it hug Zulu interjected, his voice full of innocent curiosity? I chuckled lightly at his question. Well, the hugging tree believed that love and kindness were the greatest gifts it could offer. And in sharing these gifts, it hoped to create a world where all beings felt cherished and loved. There was silence as my siblings absorbed the story, their faces a canvas of thoughtful contemplation. I hoped they understood the underpinning message of the tale, one that stressed the importance of compassion and kindness. Amidst our struggles, it was crucial to remember the power of love and how it could help even in the hardest of times. Memories of a past where men and women lacked empathy towards one another came forward. It was a hard time to live as people stepped over one another for their own self-goals, bringing others down just to have a faint feeling of happiness in their life. I hoped we would never become like that. The following day the four of us went out again, this time even more determined to succeed. Success only partially lay with us, for we needed luck on our side. Our past failures still fresh in our mind caused us to understand that trying something new was not always easy. Even I with my knowledge was not all-knowing. I was learning, adapting, and evolving just like the rest of my tribe in the hope for a better tomorrow. As we ventured deeper into the woods, the forest hummed its melody harmonizing with the chorus of creatures whispering secrets. The sun's rays were sifting through the foliage, casting a gentle warmth upon us as if echoing the sentiments of the hugging tree. The story had sparked an intimate, tranquil ambience, with only the occasional rustle of leaves and distant bird calls punctuating the serene silence. We should be like the hugging tree, Maeve eventually broke the silence, her voice imbued with newfound determination. We should keep trying, no matter what, right tack. Her words resonated within me, her youthful optimism a bomb to my doubt-infested mind. I glanced at her, my heart swelling with a concoction of pride and affection. Absolutely, Maeve, I replied, squeezing her hand gently. We should always try our best, regardless of how many times we may stumble. Our little procession carried on, with my siblings and Leora determinately scouting the surroundings. 
The occasional smile or shared glance echoed the renewed determination we felt, spurred on by the story of the hugging tree. It reminded us that resilience was a defining trait of nature, and just as the hugging tree stood unyielding in its love and kindness, we too needed to persevere in our endeavor. As we arrived at the site of our previous unsuccessful attempt, I felt a pang of hope surge within me. The trap lay ahead, silent, still and inviting. The scent of fresh fruits and vegetables wafted through the air, a tantalizing allure for any creature. Casting my lingering doubts aside, I set my resolve, turning to face my companions. All right, I declared, my voice firm, let's give this another try. Their eyes shone back at me, brimming with determination, reflecting the spirit of the hugging tree, a testament to our enduring resolve. Under the morning sun's radiant glow, we crouched near the trap, our breath held as we awaited the imminent moment. The wind rustled through the trees, its whispers barely audible above the pounding of our hearts. Suddenly, a rustle from the bushes seized our attention. The faint crunch of leaves under soft footfalls approached our trap, our hearts thrumming in our chests. Out from the greenery emerged a wild goat, its eyes curiously scanning the surroundings before landing on the fruits and vegetables laid out enticingly in the cage. We watched, scarcely daring to breathe as the goat advanced cautiously towards the cage. Its nostrils flared, sniffing the air before stepping inside the cage. As if in slow motion, we watched the door of the cage fall shut, the unmistakable sound of success echoing in our ears. A wave of exhilaration washed over us as we leapt to our feet, our shouts of triumph piercing the air. Maeve and Zulu were jumping around, their young faces painted with pure joy while Leora's radiant smile outshone the sun itself. We did it. Tack, we really did it, Maeve cried out, her laughter mixing with the morning chorus of the birds. See, I told you we're lucky, Zulu chimed in, his eyes sparkling with pride. Leora simply stood there, her smile mirroring the relief and triumph washing over me. It's because we didn't give up, she finally managed to say, her voice brimming with pride and excitement. Their celebration echoed around me, a melodious symphony of success, reminding me once again why I had taken up this seemingly impossible task. I looked at the goat now curiously munching on the vegetables in the cage, its unwitting participation in our grand scheme symbolizing the successful task in order to change us from hunter-gatherers into a society that grew its own food. I couldn't help but think back to the elder's doubts, to my own wavering faith. But as I stood there, amidst the victorious laughter and the thriving life of the wilderness, I realized that we had done more than just trap a goat. This was not just our success. It was a victory for our tribe. It was the birth of a new way, a new path, carved not just by our hands but by our hearts and minds. With a smile stretching across my face, I joined in their laughter, the sound of our shared joy echoing through the forest, a song of triumph sung by the victorious underdogs. Yes, we did it, I finally said together, we did it.